Teller Nuclear Research Facility, Pleasanton, California, Monday, 4.10 p.m. Even through the thick windows of his laboratory building, the old man could still hear the anti-nuke protesters outside, chanting, singing, shouting, always fighting against the future, trying to stall progress. It baffled him more than it angered him. The slogans hadn't changed from decade to decade. He didn't think they would ever learn. He fingered the laminated badge dangling from his lab coat. ID photos never looked like the subject in question, at least not in the past 50 years, not since his days as a minor technician for the Manhattan Project. In half a century, his face had grown gaunter, more seamed, especially over the past few years. His steel-gray hair turned an unhealthy yellowish-white where it hadn't fallen out in patches. But his eyes remained bright and inquisitive, fascinated by the mysteries hidden in dim corners of the universe. The badge identified him as Emil Gregory, and he wasn't like many of his younger colleagues who insisted on proper titles. Dr. Emil Gregory, or Emil Gregory, Ph.D., or even Emil Gregory, Project Director, he had spent too much time in New Mexico and California to worry about such formalities. His colleagues knew his name. Only scientists whose jobs were in question concerned themselves with trivialities like that, and Dr. Gregory was at the end of a long and highly successful career. Since much of his work had been classified, he wouldn't be sure of a place in the history books, but he had certainly made his place in history, whether or not anybody knew about it. His former assistant and prize student Muriel Bremen knew about it, but she had turned her back on him. In fact, she was probably one of those standing outside right now, waving her signs and chanting slogans with the other protesters. She had organized them all. Muriel had always been good at organizing pell-mell groups of people. Outside, three more protective services cars drove up in an uneasy showdown with the protesters, who continued pacing back and forth in front of the gate, blocking traffic. Uniformed security guards emerged from the squad cars, slamming doors. They stood with shoulders squared, trying to look intimidating, but they couldn't exactly do anything since the protesters had carefully remained within their rights. Moving slowly and painfully in a 72-year-old body, the warranty of which had recently run out, Dr. Gregory finally ignored the distractions outside his lab building and turned back to his computer simulations. The protesters and the guards could keep up their antics all afternoon and into the night, for all he cared. He turned up his radio to help him concentrate, though the supercomputers actually did most of the work. The color monitors on his four supercomputer workstations displayed the progress of his simultaneous hydrocode simulations. The computers chug through numerous pretend experiments, sorting through billions of iterations without requiring him to throw a single switch or hook up a single generator. Off in a separate building on the fenced-in lab site, powerful Cray-3 supercomputers crunch complex simulations for a major upcoming nuclear test, studying intricate hydrodynamic models of the radical new warhead concept to which he had devoted the last four years of his career. Bright Anvil. Imaginary automatic explosions were now the only way to study certain secondary effects and fallout patterns due to cost limitations and the on-again, off-again political treaties regarding nuclear testing. Above-ground atomic detonations had been banned by international treaty since 1963, but Dr. Gregory and his superiors believed they could get away with the Bright Anvil project, if all conditions turned out right. The Department of Energy was very eager to see that all conditions turned out right. He moved to the next simulation screen, watching the dance of contours, pressure waves, temperature graphs on a nanosecond by nanosecond scale. Already he could see that it would be a lovely explosion. Classified reports and memos littered his desk, buried under sheaths of printouts spewed from the laser printer he shared with the rest of the Bright Anvil team members down the hall. His deputy project head, Bear Dooley, had continued to post regular weather reports and satellite photos, circling the interesting areas with a red felt-tip marker. 
A large circular depression gathered over the central Pacific like spoiled milk swirling down a drain, eliciting a great deal of excitement from Dooley. Dr. Gregory had to agree with the assessment, but they couldn't proceed to the next step until he finished the final round of simulations. Though the bright anvil device had already been assembled, except for its fissile core, Gregory eschewed lazy shortcuts. When holding such incredible power at one's fingertips, caution was a good watchword. Somebody honked a car horn outside, either in support of the protesters or just annoyed in trying to get past them. Weary and self-satisfied, they would be gone by the time he headed for his own car, since he planned to stay late. At one time, Muriel Bremen, his former deputy, would have stayed working with him. A sharp and imaginative young physicist who had looked up to the older scientists with something like awe. Muriel had a great deal of talent— a genuine feel for the calculations and secondary effects. Her dedication and ambition made her the perfect research partner. But unfortunately, she also had too much conscience, doubts that festered inside her. Muriel Bremen herself had been the spearhead behind the formation of the vehement new activist group Stop Nuclear Madness centered in Berkeley. She had abandoned her work at the research facility, too spooked by certain aspects of the Bright Anvil warhead that she couldn't understand. Muriel had become a turncoat with a zeal that reminded him of how former cigarette smokers turned into the most outspoken anti-tobacco lobbyists. He thought of Muriel out there herself on the other side of the fence. She would be waving a sign, tempting the security guards to arrest her, making her point known loud and clear regardless of whether anyone wanted to hear it. At least he didn't have to worry about her replacement, Bear Dooley. Dooley was a bulldozer of a man with a dearth of tact and patience, but a singular dedication to purpose. He, at least, had his head on straight. A knock came at the half-closed door to his lab office. Patty, his secretary, poked her head in. Afternoon mail, Dr. Gregory. There's a package I thought you might like to see. Special delivery. She waggled a small, padded envelope in the air. He started to push his aching body up from his computer chair, but she waved him back down. Here, don't get up. Thanks, Patty. He took the envelope, pulling his reading glasses from his pocket and settling them on his nose so he could see the postmark. Honolulu, Hawaii. No return address. The computer calculations continued. The core of the simulated explosion had expanded, sending shock waves all the way to the edge of the monitor screen. With secondary and tertiary effects propagating in less defined directions through the plasma left behind from the initial detonation. Dr. Gregory tore open the padded envelope, working to get one finger under the heavily glued flap. He dumped the contents onto his desk and blinked, perplexed. He blew out a curious breath. The single scrap of paper wasn't exactly a letter, no stationery, no signature just carefully printed words with a fine black felt-tip pen. For your part in the past and the future. A small glassine packet fell beside the note, a translucent envelope only a few inches long, filled with some sort of black powder. He shook the envelope, but it contained nothing else. He picked up the glassine packet, squinting through his glasses. He squeezed the contents with his fingers, the substance was lightweight, faintly greasy like ash. He sniffed it, caught a faint, sour charcoal smell, mostly faded by time. Dr. Gregory frowned, letting scorn trickle into his expression. He wondered if this could be some stunt from the protesters outside. Was he supposed to believe this ash came from human remains, perhaps residue of atomic blast victims? He rolled his eyes. You can't change the world by poking your heads in the sand, Dr. Gregory muttered to them, turning his head toward the window. On the workstations, the redundant simulations neared completion after eating up hours of supercomputer time, projecting a step-by-step -step analysis of one second in time, the transient moment where a man-made device unleashed energies equivalent to the core of a sun. So far, the computers agreed with his wildest expectations. Though he himself was the project head, Dr. Gregory found parts of Bright Anvil incomprehensible, baffling theoretical assumptions and after-effects that went against all his training and experience in physics. 
But the simulations worked, and he knew enough not to ask questions from the sponsors who had presented him with the foundations of a new concept to implement. After a 56-year-long career, Dr. Gregory found it refreshing to find an entire portion of his chosen discipline that he could not explain. It opened up the wonder of science for him all over again. He tossed the black ash aside and went back to work. Suddenly, the overhead fluorescent lights in his lab flickered as if a swarm of black bees had gotten trapped in the thin glass tubes. He heard the snapping shriek of an electrical discharge, and the lights popped and died. Dr. Gregory's failing muscles sent stabs of pain through his body as he whirled in despair to see his computer workstations also winking out. Oh, no, he groaned. The system should have had infallible backup power supplies to protect them during normal electrical outages. With a computer crash, he had just lost literally billions of supercomputer iterations. He pounded his gnarled fist on his desk, then levered himself to his feet and staggered over to the window, moving more quickly than his unsteady balance and his common sense allowed. Reaching the glass, he glanced outside at the other buildings in the fenced-in complex, but saw all the other interior lights still shining in the adjacent wing of the research building. Very odd. It looked as if his office alone had been specifically targeted. With a sinking feeling, Dr. Gregory began to wonder about sabotage from the protesters. Could Muriel have gone so far overboard? She would have known how to cause such damage. Though her security clearance had been taken away after she quit her job and formed Stop Nuclear Madness, perhaps she had managed to find some method to bluff her way inside, to wreck the simulation she'd have known her old mentor would be running. He didn't want to think her capable of such an action, but he knew she would have considered it without qualms. Dr. Gregory swatted at an insistent hissing, buzzing noise in his ears, finally noticing it for the first time. With a growing sense of uneasiness that he forced himself to ignore, Dr. Gregory went to the door to shout down the hall for Bear Dooley or any of the other physicists. But he found the doorknob unbearably hot, unnaturally hot. With a hiss, he yanked his hand away, backed off, staring in shock more than pain down at the bright blisters forming in the middle of his palm. Smoke began to curl around the solid security lock doorknob oozing out of the key slot. Hey, what is this? Hello? He flapped his burnt hand to cool it. Patty, are you still out there? Contained within the concrete walls, the wind picked up inside his office, crackling with electrical static. Papers blew, curled up in a foul breath of heat. The glassine envelope of black powder spilled open, letting dark ash spray into the air. He hurried back to the door, untucking his shirt to use it as a shield against the heat so he could try again to open it. By now, though, the knob glowed red-hot, a throbbing scarlet that hurt his eyes. Patty, I need your help! Bear, somebody! His voice croaked, growing high-pitched with fear. In a rush, the light in the room grew brighter and brighter, seeming to emanate from the walls, a searing, harsh glare. Dr. Gregory backed against the concrete blocks, holding up his hands to shield his face from yet another aspect of physics he did not understand. The whispering voices increased in volume, rising to a crescendo of screams and accusations climbing through the air itself, reaching a critical point. An avalanche of heat and fire slapped him so intense that it knocked him into the wall. A billion billion x-rays brought every cell in his body to a boil. Then came a burst of absolute light, like the core of an atomic explosion. And Dr. Gregory found himself standing right at ground zero. Teller Nuclear Research Facility, Pleasanton, California. Tuesday, 10 a.m. The security guard stepped out of a small prefab shack just outside the chain-link fence perimeter of the large research facility. He glanced at Fox Mulder's papers and FBI identification, then motioned for him to take his rental car back over to the badge office just outside the gate. In the passenger seat, Scully sat up straighter, willing the cells of her body to pump more energy and bring her to full wakefulness, full alertness. She hated catching red-eye flights, especially from the East Coast. Already today, she had spent hours on the plane and now another hour with her partner driving from the San Francisco airport. She had rested fitfully on the large plane, no more than a brief nap instead of genuine sleep. Mulder guided the car to the front of a small white office isolated from the large cluster of buildings farther inside the fence. 
Mulder stepped out of the car and straightened his suit jacket, adjusted his maroon tie. They were both FBI agents, after all, and had to appear suitable for the part. I need another cup of coffee, Scully said, following him out of the car. I want to be absolutely certain I can devote my full attention to the details of a case bizarre enough to drag us across the country. A sign on the wall clearly listed all of the items that were not permitted inside the fence of the Teller Nuclear Research Facility. Cameras, firearms, drugs, alcohol, personal recording devices, telescopes. Scully scanned the items, but found it familiar from her own experience at FBI headquarters. I'll check us in, she said, and flipped open a small notebook from the pocket of her forest green suit. She waited in line behind several large men in paint-spattered overalls, feeling extremely overdressed for the occasion. Another woman opened a station at the end of the counter and gestured Scully over. I suppose I must look a little out of place here, she said, and displayed her badge. I'm Special Agent Dana Scully. My partner is Fox Mulder. We're here to meet with... Um, she glanced down at her paper again. A Department of Energy representative, a Ms. Rosabeth Carrera, who is expecting us here at the facility. The badge office woman handed Mulder and Scully each a laminated visitor's badge. Wear these at all times. Make sure they're visible and above the waist, she said, and here. She handed them each a blue plastic rectangle that clipped to the badge. It seemed to contain a strip of film and computer chip inside. These are your radiation decimeters. Always keep them on your person. Radiation decimeters, Scully asked, keeping her tone calm, devoid of any obvious worry. Is there some cause for concern here? Just a precaution, Agent Scully. We are a nuclear research facility, you understand. Mulder and Scully didn't have long to wait before a petite Hispanic woman bustled in through the glass doors, looking full of energy and enthusiasm, eager to meet them. She spotted the two FBI agents instantly and came over. I'm Rosabeth Carrera, she said, one of the DOE representatives here at the research facility. I'm very pleased you could come out on such short notice, but it is something of an emergency. If you follow me, Carrera said, we'll take you into the site and the scene of the, uh, accident. We've left everything the way it was for the past 18 hours. It is so unusual, we wanted to give you a chance to look at it fresh. We'll take my car. Carrera parked in front of the large laboratory buildings and led them quickly through the dim halls in the building up to the second floor. The echoing structure reminded Scully of a high school. Long banks of fluorescent lights lit the halls. One of the tubes overhead was gray and flickering. Scully wondered how long it had been since it needed to be replaced. The entire corridor had been blocked off with yellow plastic tape. Since the Teller Research Facility couldn't be expected to have crime scene barricades, they had settled for construction area tape. Two lab security guards stood posted on either side of the corridor, looking uncomfortable with their assignment. Down the hall beyond the yellow tape, all the other offices stood empty, though the running computers and filled bookshelves showed that they had been occupied recently. Co-workers of Dr. Emil Gregory, she wondered... If so, they would all have to be interviewed. No doubt all the workers had been relocated pending investigation of the accident. One door, though, had been tightly shut and sealed with more of the yellow tape. Rosabeth Carrera stood beside it and pulled off her own laminated picture badge, from which dangled a decimeter and several keys. Take a quick look around, she said, pushing the door open and simultaneously turning her face away. This is just first glance. You've got two minutes. Scully and Mulder stood beside each other at the threshold and stared inside. It looked as if a cluster bomb had gone off inside Dr. Gregory's lab office. Every surface had been singed with a burst of intense heat so brief yet so hot that it had curled and crisped the papers attached to Gregory's bulletin board, but had not set them completely on fire. His computer terminals, four of them, had been melted at the edges and slumped into themselves, the heavy glass cathode ray tube of the screen's tilting cockeyed like the sleepy gaze of a dead man. Even the metal desks were bowed and sagging from sudden molten weakness. Scully spotted Gregory's body against the far wall. All that remained of the old weapons researcher was a horribly crisp scarecrow of a man, his arms and legs drawn up from the contraction of muscles in intense heat like some sort of insect that had been sprayed with poison and curled up to die. Mulder stared at the destruction of the room. 
while Scully, focusing on the corpse, stepped forward, her mouth partially open in that curious mixture of human horror and analytical mindset she applied when inspecting such a crime scene. The only way she could stave off her revulsion would be to find answers. Before she could enter the room, though, Carrera placed a firm hand on her shoulder. No, nope, not yet, she said. You can't go in there. Mulder gave her a sharp look as if she had just pulled on his leash. How are we supposed to investigate a crime scene if we can't go inside? Too much residual radiation, Carrera said. You need to take more precautions, full contamination gear, before you go inside. She turned and they followed her down the corridor. Let's get you both suited up. The thick outfit made Mulder look like an astronaut. He found it difficult to move, but his eagerness to investigate the mysterious death of Dr. Emil Gregory convinced him to put up with the difficulties. Next to him, Rosabeth Carrera stood with her hands at her sides, looking uncertain as to what she should do. She had declined to suit up and accompany them into the scene. "'You're free to go in and look around as much as you like,' Carrera said. "'Meanwhile, I've arranged for all the paperwork to allow you free access to the site. You'll have need-to-know clearance for this case only. The Department of Energy and Teller Labs are eager to find out what caused Dr. Gregory's death.' Dr. Gregory was working on computer simulations. He had no fissile material whatsoever in his lab, nothing that should have had the destructive potential that we see here, nothing at all deadly. The equipment was no more dangerous than a video game. Rosabeth Carrera gave them each a handheld radiation detector. They looked just like the kind Mulder had seen in dozens of 1950s B-movies of uncontrolled nuclear tests that created mutations whose bizarreness was limited only by Hollywood's meager special effects budgets of the era. Let's go inside, Mulder, Scully said, standing at the door, anxious to get to work. Carrera used the key on her badge again, pushing the lab door open. Mulder and Scully entered Dr. Gregory's laboratory, and the radiation detector went wild. Mulder watched the needle dance high on the gauge, though he didn't hear the loud frying bacon crackle of Geiger counters used so often in the films. The silent needle gave its own ominous signal, though. Within its concrete block walls, this office had somehow been the site of an intense burst of radiation that had blistered the paint, seared the concrete, and melted the furniture. The flash had left residual and secondary radioactivity that still simmered, gradually fading. Mulder's breathing resonated in his ears from the respirator in the self-contained suit. It sounded as if someone were breathing down his neck, a long-fanged monster riding on his shoulder. Claustrophobia hammered around him as he stepped deeper into the burned laboratory. Looking at all the melted and flash-burned artifacts sent a deep shudder down his spine, tapping into his long-standing revulsion of fire. Scully went straight over to the body while Mulder stopped to inspect the heat slump computer terminals, the melted desks, the flash-burned papers on the bulletin board and one of the work tables. No indication of where the burst might have originated, he said, poking around the debris. The walls were adorned with photographs of Pacific Islands, satellite shots and airplane photos, as well as computer printouts of weather maps of the ocean wind patterns, storm projections, and blistered black-and-white prints of weather satellite images. Everything centered on the Western Pacific, just past the international date line. Scully bent over the burned body of Dr. Gregory. If we can determine what he was working on, get some details of the weapon system and any tests he was planning to run, we might be able to come up with a more clear-cut explanation. Clear-cut, Scully, Mulder said. You surprise me. Think about it, Mulder. He was a, a weapons researcher. What if he was working on some new high-energy burst weapon? It's, it's possible he had a prototype in here and he accidentally set it off. It could have flash-fried everything you see here and killed him. If it was just a small test model, its effect would be limited. It might not destroy the entire building. Good for us, he said, but look around. I don't see the remains of any weapon, do you? Even if it exploded, there should be some evidence. We should still look into it, Scully answered. I need to take the body in for an autopsy. I'll request that Miss Carrera find us a local medical facility where I can work. Mulder stood preoccupied by Gregory's bulletin board. He reached out with a gloved hand to touch one of the curled papers still fastened by a slagged pushpin to the corkboard. When he brushed the paper with his fingertips, it fell into ash rippling away into the air. Nothing remained but a powdery residue. 
Mulder looked around for thick stacks of paper, hoping that something might have been left intact, like the photos on the walls. He searched Dr. Gregory's desk for piles of technical reports or journal articles, but found nothing. Then he noticed the pale rectangular marks on the desktop. Hey, Scully, look at this, he said. When she came over, he pointed to the rectangular patches. I think there must have been some documents here, reports left on the top of his desk, but somebody's removed the evidence. Why would anyone do that? Scully asked. The reports themselves probably have residual radioactivity. Mulder met her gaze through the thin faceplates on their hoods. I think somebody's trying to do us a favor. They've sanitized the murder scene to protect us from classified information that maybe we shouldn't be seeing. For our own good, of course. Mulder, how can we possibly expect to solve this if we don't have all the information? My feeling exactly, he said. He looked at the burn marks on the shelves themselves. As he had expected, several books had been removed as well. Somebody wants a quick answer to this, Scully, he said. A simple answer, one that doesn't require us to have all the information. He looked towards the closed lab door. I think we should inspect each of these other offices down the corridor, too. If they're offices of Dr. Gregory's project team, somebody might have forgotten to yank out the information that was carefully deleted from this scene. He went back to the bulletin board and touched another piece of the crumbling paper. The ash flaked off, but he was able to distinguish two words before it disintegrated. Bright Anvil. Teller Nuclear Research Facility, Tuesday, 3.43 p.m. With his visitor's badge firmly clipped to his collar, Mulder felt like a door-to-door -door salesman. He followed his map of the teller facility on which Rosabeth Carrera had circled the building number where Dr. Gregory's project team were temporarily stationed. He found the building, a dilapidated ancient barracks, two stories tall, with window panes so old that the glass had begun to ripple with age. Mulder trudged up the old wooden stairs and yanked open the door, which stuck briefly in its frame. He entered, but the hall was empty. Mulder saw only a kitchenette with a coffee maker and a big plastic jug of spring water sitting on a cooler. A laser-printed sign on salmon-colored paper was tacked to the wall, and Mulder saw several other copies posted up and down the hall on doors and on bulletin boards. Warning. Asbestos removal operations in progress. Mulder glanced at the yellow note of paper on which he had written Bear Dooley's temporary office number. I hope it's not down there, he said, looking at the asbestos worksite. He turned right instead, checking doorways, most of which were closed. Not necessarily because the rooms were empty, but because the people couldn't work with so much noise in the halls. He finally reached Bear Dooley's half-closed office door. Inside the dim room, a large man wearing a denim jacket and flannel shirt and jeans moved boxes on top of tall black file cabinets, stacking objects hastily retrieved from his old office. Mulder rapped on the door with his knuckles and pushed it farther open. Excuse me, Dr. Dooley? The man turned to look at him. He had long reddish-brown hair and a shaggy beard that looked like it was made of copper wire— except for a striking shot of white down the left side of his chin, as if he had spilled milk there. His mouth and nose were covered with a white filter mask. Get a mask on, are you crazy, he said. Dooley moved like a quarterback to his battered temporary desk, where he popped open the top right-hand drawer and snatched out a filter packet. With his big hands, he tore off the plastic and tossed the mask to Mulder. You FBI guys are supposed to be smart. I'd think you'd pay attention to a few simple safety precautions. Mulder sheepishly fastened the mask around his face with the long elastic band and breathed through the paper-smelling covering. He held his badge in his hand, flipping open his ID to display the photo and badge. Bear Dooley, I presume. How did you know I was with the FBI? The big man let out a loud laugh. Are you kidding? A suit and tie means you're either with the Department of Energy or the FBI, and... With Dr. Gregory's death, I assumed you were FBI. We were told to expect you and to cooperate. Thanks, Mulder said. I've only got a few questions for you at the moment, so I'll try not to take too long. We're still at the beginning of our investigation. Dooley continued to unload his possessions from cardboard boxes, shoving folders into file cabinet drawers and dumping pens and notepads into the long center drawer on his desk. 
First off, Mulder said, can you tell me something about the project you and Dr. Gregory are working on? Nope, Bear Dooley said. Can't tell you about it. It's a classified project. I see, Mulder said. Well, can you think of any unclassified way that any part of this project might have backfired and killed Dr. Gregory? Nope again, Dooley said. Mulder got the impression that Bear Dooley was always this gruff with newcomers, but that right now the man was particularly distracted. Perhaps he was more than a little overwhelmed to have the entire project thrust upon him so suddenly. Mulder tried to piece together a scenario where Bear Dooley wanting to become the new big shot would arrange for the death of the real project head, thereby setting himself up to become the obvious successor. But somehow it didn't ring true. Dooley didn't seem to be enjoying himself. Maybe we'd better try a safer area. How long have you worked for Dr. Gregory, Mulder asked. Dooley stopped and scratched his head. Four or five years, I guess, most of the time as a technician. I worked hard, but now he's left me with a set of big shoes to fill. How long have you been as deputy project director? Dooley answered that one more quickly. Eleven months, ever since Muriel flaked out on us. What's all this stuff about the South Sea Islands, Mulder said, gesturing to the photos. Aerial images and weather patterns. Dooley shrugged and hesitated a moment as he concocted an explanation. Maybe I'm planning a vacation. Get away from it all, you know. Besides, that's the Western Pacific, not the South Seas. Funny, Dr. Gregory had similar photos in his office. Could be we have the same travel agent, Dooley answered. Mulder leaned forward. He found it difficult to conduct a serious interrogation while both of them were wearing absurd filter masks. Tell me about Bright Anvil. Never heard of it, Dooley answered crisply. Yes, you have. You don't have a need to know, Dooley countered. I have a security clearance, Mulder said. Your FBI clearances don't mean a damn thing to me, Agent Mulder, Dooley said. I've signed papers. I've gone to my security briefing. I know the level of classification my work falls under. Unlike certain other assistants of Dr. Gregory, I take my oath seriously. Dooley pointed a blunt, large finger at Mulder. You might not realize this, Mr. FBI, but you and I are on the same side. I'm fighting for this country, doing what our government deems necessary. If you want to blabbermouth, why don't you go see Muriel Bremen at her Stop Nuclear Madness headquarters, then arrest her for divulging national security information? You can find the address in any one of a thousand or so leaflets they left scattered in the ditches and along the fence yesterday. Go ask her your questions. She was around when Emile Gregory died, and she had plenty of motive to mess up our project. Mulder looked at him sharply. Tell me more. Bear Dooley's color deepened as his long-standing resentment boiled to the surface. She and her protesters were here the whole time. They threatened to stop at nothing, nothing to sabotage our work. Muriel would know how to do it since she worked here long enough. Maybe she's the one who planted something in Gregory's office. Maybe she's behind it all. We'll check it out, Mulder said. Now I've got a lot of work to do, Agent Mulder. I was already up to my nose in responsibilities, and now it's gotten even worse. Add to that the fact that I've been pulled out of my offices and stuck in this god-awful hole trying to make do working on a project in a barracks building where I can't even pull out any of my classified papers. Mulder thought of something else as he stepped to the door. I noticed in Dr. Gregory's office that some of his reports and papers had been taken away from the death scene. Disturbing the evidence that a crime scene is a serious offense. You didn't have anything to do with that, did you? All of our project reports are controlled documents, Agent Mulder, numbered and assigned to a specific user. Some of Dr. Gregory's reports were one of a kind. Maybe it was something we needed for our work. A project takes precedence. Over a murder investigation? Who told you that? Ask the Department of Energy. They might not tell you much about the project, but they will tell you that much. Mulder kept his cool. He reached into his pocket and removed one of his cards. This is the main office of the Bureau. You can reach me through the federal telephone system. Or call me on my cellular if you think of anything else you can tell me. Sure. Dooley took the card and offhandedly opened up the center desk drawer, already cluttered with pens and rulers, pushpins, paper clips, and other debris. He tossed the card inside where he would probably never be able to find it again, even if he wanted to. Mulder didn't get the impression Bear Dooley would want to. Teller Nuclear Research Facility, Wednesday, 12.15 p.m. Dooley wanted his old office back. 
He passionately disliked these temporary quarters. He felt as if he were camping in his own workplace, roughing it, Mark Twain would have called it. Such distractions annoyed him. The Bright Anvil project was too important for him and his co-workers to make do while the investigation into Dr. Gregory's death continued. The project had a very narrow window of time and conditions had to be exactly right. Just let Bright Anvil go off without a hitch, he thought, and the FBI agents could have all the time they wanted. He glanced at his watch. The new satellite images were ten minutes overdue. Dooley reached for the phone. Victor, where's the weather report? He said without wasting time with a greeting or cordialities. His young assistant could certainly recognize his booming voice by now. We've got it, Bear. I was just double-checking and triple-checking the meteorological projections. Uh, I think you'll like them this time around. We'll get them over here, Dooley said, so I can check them a fourth time. Things have to be exactly right. Dooley sat back in the creaking old chair, trying to get comfortable. Out in the halls, the construction workers continued their hammering and pounding, tearing down the walls. Plastic sheeting lay draped over everything as they ransacked another wing of the building. The barracks outside door opened, and Victor Ogilvy bounded up the wooden stairs, then down the linoleum hallway to Dooley's temporary office. He burst in, his face florid, grinning with the eagerness of Jimmy Olsen hot on a new story. His glasses slipped down his nose. Here's the satellite printouts, he said, and here's the overlays. He spread the projections on Dooley's cleared desk. See the storm clouds here, Bear? Ninety-five percent projection that it'll follow the path I've marked with red dashes. He traced a big-knuckled finger along a contour in the western Pacific, just past the international date line in the Marshall Islands. I've looked for projected landfalls, and there seems to be an absolutely perfect target right here. Victor's finger completely obliterated a minuscule dot that looked like a printer's error in the middle of the ocean. Bingo. Dooley looked down. Anika Atoll. Ooh, exciting, he said, reading the brief description. A big flat rock out in the middle of nowhere. No recent photos, but it sounds tailor-made for our purposes. No existing settlements, not even any history. Nobody will ever notice anything there, Victor agreed. Hurricane warnings have gone out to all the adjacent islands. There's not much in the vicinity, only a few sparsely populated islands. Dooley nodded. All right, let's start making phone calls. As of right now, I'm activating Bright Anvil. We're on our way. Let's get the Corps of Engineers flown out to Anika. Get our destroyer on standby down at Coronado Naval Base, ready to move out as soon as we arrive. The young assistant scuttled toward the door, but Dooley called after him. Oh, and Victor? The other man turned around, blinking owlishly behind his glasses, his mouth partly open. Don't forget to bring the suntan lotion. Victor laughed and disappeared down the hall. Dooley stared down at the maps and weather charts again, letting a smile creep across his face. Finally, after all this time, they were going to move to the next step. There could be no turning back once the wheels started moving. Besides, he had to admit he wasn't terribly sorry to be away from those nosy FBI investigators. He had work to do. Stop Nuclear Madness, Headquarters, Berkeley, California. Wednesday, 12.36 p.m. Scully took the rental car and drove alone into Berkeley, following familiar highways. Now, though, she sensed she had become an intruder in a place where she had once felt at home. Heading down Telegraph Avenue towards the campus, Scully saw that the university remained basically unchanged. It stood like an island of its own ferociously independent culture, the People's Republic of Berkeley, while the rest of the world went on its way. Scully parked in a public ramp and walked out into the sunshine, pushing sunglasses up on her nose and scanning the streets to get her bearings. She walked along, glancing at kiosks announcing student film festivals, rallies, and fundraising events. Tracking building numbers, Scully finally found the Stop Nuclear Madness headquarters in a tall, old building that looked as if it could have been the set for a courthouse in an old black-and-white movie. A diner and a coffee shop shared the street level of the building with a large new-and-used bookstore that catered to students. A short flight of concrete steps led down from the sidewalk below street level. An easel propped beside the stairs held a poster board with stenciled letters announcing the protest group in something called the Museum of Nuclear Horrors. She pushed open the basement door and entered the Stop Nuclear Madness headquarters. She felt transported back in time. She remembered when she had been younger, filled with enthusiasm to change the world. 
As she entered the small offices, the woman behind the desk turned to give her an automatic smile, but froze with instant suspicion upon seeing her professional garb. Scully felt a sinking in her stomach. The young receptionist was in her early twenties, with skin the color of light milk chocolate and bushy hair knotted into a medusa swirl of dangling dreadlocks. Scully pulled out her ID. I'm Special Agent Dana Scully from the FBI. I'm here to speak with a Miss Muriel Bremen. Becca Thorne's eyebrows went up. I... I'll see if she's here, she said. Her voice was cold and uninviting, her guard up. Again, Scully felt a pang of disappointment. Yes, Agent Scully, a woman's terse voice said. Scully turned to see Muriel Bremen, a tall woman with short, wavy brown hair, cut in an unflattering, squarish style. She was not an attractive woman, but her bearing and her voice bespoke a no-nonsense quality of intelligence. Now what did we do? Muriel said impatiently, not allowing Scully to speak. I'm getting tired of all this harassment. We filed the appropriate papers, given the required notices, obtained the correct permits. What on earth has my group done to attract the attention of the FBI? I'm not investigating your group, Miss Bremen, Scully said. I'm looking into the death of a Dr. Emil Gregory two days ago at the Telenuclear Research Facility. Muriel Bremen's countenance cracked, and she seemed to sag. Oh, she said. Emil, that, that's different. She paused, gripping the receptionist's table with one clenched hand and took a deep breath. Becca Thorne watched to see if she could help, then surreptitiously disappeared to attend the photocopy machine. Sure, let's talk, Agent Scully, Muriel Bremen said. But not here. Muriel Bremen led the way to a small microbrewery and restaurant only a few blocks walk from the heart of the university. You order food over there. Muriel indicated a small counter. The vegetarian chili is a specialty, but the soup's pretty good, too, and... Of course, a sandwich is a sandwich is a sandwich. People come here for the beer. Best you'll find anywhere. When they returned to their table, Scully tried to think of where to begin, but Muriel preempted her. The protester seemed to have no problems with self-expression, bypassing time-consuming pleasantries and the dance of conversational give and take before Scully could get around to the real questions. So let me tell you why I think you're here, she said. It's one of two possibilities. Either you think I or someone from my protest group has in some way caused the death of Emil Gregory, or you've been stymied by your escorts at Teller, your lack of appropriate security clearances, and your inability to access classified documents. Nobody will tell you anything, and you've come here thinking that I can give you some answers. Scully spoke slowly. A little of both, Miss Bremen. I've completed the autopsy on Dr. Gregory. There's little doubt as to primary injuries that resulted in his death, but I haven't yet been able to determine how they came about. What did Dr. Gregory stumble into that caused his death? I'll have to admit your protest group does have a credible motive for wanting Dr. Gregory out of the picture, so I have to investigate it. I also know that Dr. Gregory, a man you worked with, was involved in some sort of new classified weapons project, something called Bright Anvil, but nobody will tell us what that is, and here you are, Miss Bremen, at the intersection of both of my lines of reasoning. Well, then let me tell you something, Muriel said, folding her hands around her pint of dark beer and taking a long swallow. It sounds cliché to say that I have nothing to hide, but in this instance I truly don't. It works to my benefit to tell more and more people about what's really going on at the Telenuclear Research Facility. I've been trying to blow the whistle for the past year— here, I brought along some of our group's brochures. She reached into her pocket and handed over two of the hand-folded photocopied pamphlets that some volunteer had no doubt designed and laid out on a personal computer. Back when I worked at the Teller facility, I was quite a devoted assistant to Dr. Gregory, she said, settling her long chin into her hand. For many years, Emil was my mentor. He helped me along through the politics and the paperwork and the progress reports so I could do some real work. But you had some sort of falling out, Scully said. In a way, but not exactly like that, Muriel said, then sidestepped the question. 
You want to know what bright anvil is. It's an unorthodox type of nuclear explosive. These days, despite the end of the Cold War and the supposed downscaling of nuclear weapons development, bright anvil is a very special type of warhead using a technology that... She paused, then stared at the walls. It's a technology that seems to operate beyond the laws of physics, as I know them, and I do know physics, Agent Scully. The whole Bright Anvil project was invisible on the ledger sheets. It was funded by non-traditional means, money skimmed from other projects to pay for new tests, new research, unorthodox concepts. It was never listed on any budget ever submitted to Congress, and you won't be able to track it down. Emil had worked in the nuclear weapons industry for many years. He was even at the Trinity test himself back in 1945. She smiled wanly. He used to tell her stories. Her lips trembled for just a moment, but she covered it by eating some of her chili. But by now he was at the end of his career. He thought he was covering it up from all of us, but I don't think he was in very good health. Scully nodded, but did not ask any questions. Emil wanted to do something important to end his career on a high point. Then, Bright Anvil fell in his lap. Someone else had done the preliminary physics. We got designs for exotic, high-energy, pulse-power sources. It was a done deal. The components worked, although I couldn't figure out how or why, but Emil didn't worry about that. He got all excited. He saw how such technology could be used to create a fundamentally new kind of warhead— Emil took it and ran with it. Even from the start, I had my doubts, but I kidded myself. I followed along because Emil was my mentor. This was our new project. I helped him run simulations, exercises that had little likelihood of ever coming about for real. But the more I worked with it, the creepier it became. Bright Anvil was just too weird. It didn't seem to come from any physics I was ever taught in school. No technology I know can do what it does. Some of the components of the device were fabricated elsewhere. We never knew where or how. We just received them from the program offices in Washington. Then, in one of those serendipitous occurrences, I went to a conference in Japan. Just out of curiosity, I took a side trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, like a weapons researcher's pilgrimage. Both cities have been rebuilt by now, but it's like putting makeup over a scar. I began to check into things. Do you know what they did to the Marshall Islands with the nuclear tests in the 50s? Do you know how many Pacific Islanders were booted off their homes, their peaceful, idyllic island existence, just so somebody could blow up a big bomb? Yes, said Scully. I know. Muriel Bremen abruptly stood, having finished most of her lunch. She brushed off the front of her shirt. I apologize. I was giving you a sermon. She nudged the Stop Nuclear Madness brochures across the booth closer to Scully. Read these if you want more information about it and about us. I won't take up any more of your time. She slipped out of the seat. Scully glanced down and saw that she had finished only half of her own lunch. Muriel Bremen had already ducked out the door, leaving Scully alone in the restaurant before she could think of an intelligent question. Coronado Naval Base, San Diego, California, Thursday, 10.34 a.m. From the Coronado shipyards, the ocean sprawled westward beyond the curve of the earth, deep blue and dazzling with reflected morning sunlight. The weather struck Bear Dooley as incredibly mild, sunny but cooled by fresh breezes, so that even his flannel shirt and denim jacket were tolerable. A young officer in white dress uniform met Bear Dooley at the docks. Dooley didn't know Navy rank or the regulations of when sailors were supposed to wear certain uniforms, but he got the impression that this blond-haired, clean-cut man might be someone of more than average importance. The sailor gave him a smart salute. "'Mr. Dooley, sir,' the man said. I'm Lee Clancy, first officer of the USS Dallas, here to escort you on board our ship. If you follow me, sir, Captain Ives is ready to see you. We've recalled the entire crew and kept them busy provisioning the ship and preparing to shove off. We'll be ready to get underway as soon as you're prepared. How was your trip? Clancy asked. 
Yeah, the, the flight was fine, Dooley said. Did all the equipment arrive safe on board? I believe so, sir, Clancy answered, sometime late last night. The disguised and armored semi-truck, the safe, secure transport, had left at sunset the previous day and had driven through the night on the California freeways to reach San Diego at the bottom of the state. The drivers were escorted front and back by armored nondescript vans whose drivers and passengers had orders to shoot to kill, no questions asked, should problems arise to threaten the Bright Anvil nuclear device. The two of them strode along the dock, past several other chain-link fences and gates guarded by armed military police. Finally, Dooley saw the large Navy destroyer that had been assigned to his project. The enormous, sleek ship looked like a skyscraper in the water, with weapons, mounts, and control towers, radar antennas, satellite uplink dishes, meteorological instruments, and various other superstructures Dooley could not identify. Navy stuff, he figured. Dooley stopped and looked along the length of the gigantic cruiser. Despite his usual gruff demeanor, he had to admit he was impressed with the vessel. There she is, Mr. Dooley, Clancy said. He snapped to attention and began to rattle off the ship's statistics. They seemed to be a matter of pride with him rather than a memorized speech. The Dallas, Spruance class, built in 1971. 563 feet overall length, powered by four sets of GE gas turbines. She's got a small captain's gig for quick trips ashore, plus an entire surface-to-air missile battery, anti-submarine weapons and torpedo tubes. This class of battleship was designed primarily for anti-submarine warfare, but she's lightly armed and carries a minimal crew. The Dallas is the finest vessel in her class, if you ask me, sir. She'll get us out to the islands no matter what the weather. The first officer led him up a wide gangplank the size of a freeway entrance ramp and marched him across the deck up several flights of hard metal steps to the bridge tower, where he introduced Dooley to the captain of the Dallas. Captain Ive, sir, this is Mr. Dooley, Clancy said after he had exchanged salutes with the captain. The first officer nodded to Dooley. I'll take your duffel to your stateroom, sir. I'm sure Captain Ives wishes to speak with you in detail. Yes, I do, the captain answered. Pleased to meet you, Captain Ives. Thanks for your help. Dooley extended his hand, and the captain took his grip with a firm shake. Ives was a lean man in his early sixties, as tall as Dooley but less burly. His chin was narrow, his eyes slate gray under heavy salt and pepper eyebrows. A bristling mustache rode his upper lip, and steel gray hair lay neatly beneath his white captain's cap. He showed no sign of sweating in the heat. Perhaps he didn't allow it. Mr. Dooley, I'm sure your first concern is about your delicate equipment. Let me reassure you that everything has arrived safely and intact, as far as we can tell. Good, Dooley said, his voice curt. He wanted to make certain at the outset that the captain understood that Dooley was in charge and that his instructions were not to be questioned. If that equipment is damaged, we might as well not even bother to go. When do we set sail? The Dallas can leave port at about four o'clock this afternoon, Captain Ives said, but you may have noticed that this Navy destroyer has no sails. Dooley blinked at him, then understood. Oh, just a turn of phrase, he said, annoyed. Do you have any weather charts or updates for me? We received an encrypted signal, the captain said, a report from a fast flyby of an aircraft out of our Kwajalein tracking station. Anika Atoll checks out. We'll be heading out for the Marshall Islands at full engine power, but it'll still take us five days. Five days, Dooley said. I was afraid of that. Ives met him with a steely gaze. This isn't an aircraft, Mr. Dooley. It takes a long time to get a ship this size across that much water. All right, all right, Dooley said. I suppose I knew that. Do we have weather satellites? Is the storm system still doing what we expected? Ives led him over to a chart table where weather maps and satellite photos lay spread out. With one long finger, the captain indicated the swirl of clouds out over the deep, featureless water. The tropical depression is worsening, as expected. Within a few days, it should be at full hurricane strength. According to our projections, it is heading straight towards the atoll. Good, good, Dooley leaned over, rubbing his hands together. Though he was a physicist and an engineer, he had learned a great deal about meteorology during the preparations for this test. 
Captain Ives leaned closer and lowered his voice so that the other seamen on the bridge deck would not hear him from their communications or navigation stations. Let me be blunt, Mr. Dooley. I have already expressed to my superiors my extreme objections to the entire purpose of this mission. I have grave doubts about the wisdom of resuming above-ground nuclear tests no matter where they occur. Dooley stiffened and turned toward the captain, pausing just a moment to scratch his beard and allow his blood pressure to drop slightly. Then maybe you just don't understand the necessity, Captain. I understand all right more than you know, Ives replied. You see, I've been present at several hydrogen bomb tests already, one of which I doubt even you know about, since all the results were highly classified. Dooley raised his eyebrows. When? Back in the fifties, Ives said. I was just a junior officer then, but I was there, out in the islands, and a wee talk, bikini, even Johnston Atoll near Hawaii. I worked with plenty of eggheads who were so amazed by their own calculations, so confident in what they had invented. But I can tell you this, Mr. Dooley. Every single time those weapons developers like yourself, people who were so smug about their own abilities, were literally turned to jelly with awe when they watched their device go off. I look forward to it, then, Dooley said crisply. Let me do my work, Captain Ives. You just keep the ship from sinking. Kamita Imports, Honolulu, Hawaii. Friday, 2.20 p.m. Sitting at his impeccably neat and carefully arranged desk in the high-rise office building, Ryan Kamita carefully addressed a padded envelope. His pen moved in precise strokes and the letters came out perfect. Expansive windows covered two walls of his corner office, offering a panoramic view of Oahu. But Kamita kept the mini-blinds half-closed most of the time. He dearly loved the gentle warmth of the sun, feeling its heat bathe his scarred skin, soothing, caressing his body, like barely remembered idyllic days on an isolated Pacific island. But too much bright sunshine felt like fire to him. It reminded him of that other blaze from the sky, the searing flash so intense that it had set the air molecules themselves on fire. Kamita's snow-white hair lay neatly on his head, perfectly maintained, thick and nicely cut, because of the almost supernatural good fortune he had experienced during his adult life, Kamita had plenty of money for things like that, clothes, grooming, possessions. But his money couldn't buy everything. He didn't want everything. His burned hands gripped the felt-tip pen as if it were a weapon, and in a sense that's exactly what it was. The words resounded in his head, he filled out the address in a careful, perfect script, feeling for the right spot on the padded envelope. He could sense the accuracy of his letters. Satisfied, Kamita clicked the cap back on the pen. Then he reached out to hold the special envelope, feeling its edges, the sharp corners. He took it on faith that he had filled out the address correctly. He would never ask anyone else to double-check it, though he could not see it himself. Ryan Kamita was completely blind. The list in his mind grew shorter and shorter with each package he sent, each target he identified. Kamita kept the names of those responsible clear in his well-honed memory. No doubt to assuage its unspoken pangs of guilt, the government had assisted Ryan Kamita through the years, sometimes giving veiled handouts, other times blatantly approving his proposals and choosing him over his competitors. Kamita had used whatever resources were available to build his company into a successful business that specialized in exotic imports from little-known Pacific islands. He needed the money to accomplish his true mission. Kamita fingered the envelope, stuffed the handwritten note in the small glass vial inside, then sealed it. That simple act of closure brought a shudder of relief to him, but it lasted only a moment. No matter how many such packages he sent, no matter how many victims he identified, he could never make up for the loss of his people. In a single stroke, Ryan Kamita's family, his relatives, his tribe, his island, had vanished in a surge of light and flames. A small boy was the only survivor. But Kamita did not consider his survival to be a miracle or a blessing. He had been given an entire lifetime to endure the memory of those few seconds, while for all the others it had been over in an instant. Or so he had thought. The voices in his head had not stopped screaming since that day when he was ten years old. Setting the envelope aside for immediate pickup, he tilted his burned face and blank white eyes toward the ceiling. 
He couldn't see, but he could feel, could sense the gathering storm. The ghosts of his incinerated people grew more and more restless. They would strike out at their own targets if he refused to give them a victim of his own choosing. The ghosts had waited so long, and Ryan Kamita could no longer keep them under control. He picked up the hand-addressed envelope and left his room, walking to the mail drop from which the package would be rushed to an airplane and shipped to the mainland United States. It would be delivered to a particular low-profile but very important official of the Department of Energy headquarters near Washington, D.C. It was probably already too late to stop Bright Anvil, he supposed, but perhaps this would be enough to prevent the nightmare from occurring again. Sheck Residence, Gaithersburg, Maryland, Monday, 6.37 p.m. It was a hot and humid late afternoon in the Washington, D.C. area. On days like this, Nancy Sheck knew that all the hassle of maintaining a swimming pool in her fenced-in backyard paid off. She let the front screen door close by itself in her big brick front house with black shutters. It was just the kind of imposing mansion an important Department of Energy executive was supposed to own— and she relished it. Such a mansion was far more than she needed, but Nancy Sheck didn't like the implications of settling for a more modest dwelling. Not now. All her career she had been concerned with moving up in the world, trudging forward, clawing her way to the top. At the moment, though, Nancy couldn't wait to get out of her clothes and take a long, luxurious dip in the pool. She snagged the usual pile of mail and dropped it unceremoniously on the kitchen counter, she punched the answering machine to listen to the messages left there. The second message was in a rich, familiar voice. The words sounded formal and innocuous, but she could detect the hidden passion behind them, a cordiality that went orders of magnitude beyond a mere business relationship, or even a good friendship. In her persona at work, she called him Brigadier General Matthew Braducas and at cocktail parties and Department of Energy social functions, she still called him General Burducas. During his frequent visits here in her backyard and on the patio, she allowed herself to call him Matthew. And while they were in bed, she moaned endearing and never-to-be-repeated names into his ear. He didn't identify himself on the answering machine, not that he needed to. It's me. I'm a little late at the office, so I won't be over until 7.30 or so, I'm going to stop by my house and pick up the two porterhouse steaks I've been marinating in the fridge all day. We'll throw them on the barbecue grill, then we can take a swim, and... whatever. With so many parts of the project coming to a head, reaching its climax, Nancy giggled. Knowing he had picked the turn of phrase intentionally, she found it very erotic. We both need a little release from our tension. The tone beeped, and the tape rewound. In her bedroom, she stripped out of her clothes and, smiling to herself, she yanked down the satin sheets on her bed before changing into her bathing suit, black and smooth and slick. Nancy grabbed one of the plush beach towels from the closet and went through the kitchen, pausing to pour herself a whiskey sour. She took the mail and her drink out the back patio door to sit by the pool. Nancy slicked tanning oil on her bare legs and arms and shoulders, massaging it into her neck, imagining Matthew's strong fingers working it there. She tried to distract herself by opening the mail, sifting through the form letters, advertising circulars, and junk mail without interest, until she came upon an express delivery package with no return address and a postmark from Honolulu. Maybe I want a free trip for two, she said, and tore open the envelope. To her disappointment, she discovered only a small glass vial of fine black ash and a small scrap of paper. The message was written in neatly printed letters, carefully formed capitals, like a note from a kidnapper who wanted to make sure his handwriting would not be recognized. For your part in the future. She frowned at the note. What part in the future? Out of curiosity, she shook the vial of black ash. Am I supposed to convince people to stop smoking? Nancy stood up, disgusted at somebody's lame idea of a joke. Whoever was trying to threaten her or pull her leg couldn't do a very good job unless she understood what the point was. Next time, give a few more details, she said, tossing the note on the patio table. Nancy decided not to worry about it. She was wasting good swimming time. By the edge of the pool, the bug light crackled and snapped. 
She watched it give off blue sparks as it fed upon whatever gnats or mosquitoes had been lured to their doom in its voltage differential. Take that, she said with a grin. Then the other bug lamps began to spark, frying loudly, buzzing, popping. The lights flickered violently. The sparks returned like miniature lightning storms. Finally, one by one, each bug light erupted like a small bomb with a geyser of blue electrical sparks like a Roman candle into the air. What's going on here, damn it? Nancy slammed her drink down. She felt unprotected and defenseless out here with only her black bathing suit. Maybe if she could get to a phone. Voices came at her from all sides, speaking strange and primal languages, swirling invisibly around her ears, but she could see nothing. Suddenly, the air itself sparked and discharged. Blue-white arcs shot from her lounge chair to the patio table. Help, she cried. Nancy turned to run, but slipped, reaching out instinctively to grab for support. When she touched the chair, skittering electricity shot into her own arms in a burning discharge. She opened her mouth to scream, and sparks danced from the fillings in her teeth. Her ash-blonde hair rose up into the air like Medusa strands, waving from side to side in a nimbus around her head. Nancy staggered towards the edge of the pool, desperately seeking some sanctuary there. Her skin crawled and burned, alive with static electricity. She dropped the vial of ashes into the water. The gathering storm of harsh light surrounded her, screaming voices growing louder, critical mass. A sudden rush of thunder engulfed her. The intense firestorm crisped her eyes. The force of the blast of heat and radiation slammed her backward into the pool with a surge of light. A cloud of vaporized water swept upward like a fog bank into the sky. The last after image on Nancy Sheck's optic nerve showed a spectral, impossible mushroom cloud. Sheck Residence, Gaithersburg, Maryland, Tuesday, 1.04 p.m. The body looked the same as the other Mulder thought. Severely charred, crackling with residual radiation, twisted in a flash-burned insect-like pose that reminded him of the famous lithograph by Edward Munch, The Scream. A local policeman stopped them from entering the pool area, but Mulder flashed his badge and ID. Federal agents, he said. I'm Special Agent Mulder. This is Agent Scully. We've been flown in to look at the site and examine the body. A homicide detective was studying clues and taking notes around the pool and patio. He looked baffled. He overheard Mulder's introduction and looked up. FBI? Now that's calling in the big guns. Why were you brought out here? We might have a certain background on this case, Scully answered. This death may be related to another investigation we're working on. The detective raised his eyebrows, then gave a weary shrug. Anything you guys can do to help takes work off my shoulders. This is a weird one, all right. Never seen anything like it. No question this one goes in your special file cabinet, Scully said quietly to Mulder. Scully began a perimeter inspection of the crime scene, working around the bustling evidence technicians and detectives. She took out a small knife to pry into a large charred patch on the redwood fence that bounded the Sheck property. The burn doesn't go very deep, she said, flaking away an external film of charcoal, as if the heat was intense but very brief. Mulder placed his hands on his hips and turned slowly around, hoping that an answer would jump right out at him. But nothing did. Okay, Skelly, he said, this time we're not at a nuclear research lab or a missile testing site, just somebody's patio in Maryland. How are you going to explain this one scientifically? Scully sighed. Mulder, right now I'm not even sure how you're going to try and explain it. Not necessarily by the book, he said. First off, I'm going to see if there was any connection between Nancy Sheck and Emil Gregory, or nuclear weapons testing, or even the Manhattan Project. It could be anything. She wasn't old enough to be involved with the Manhattan Project in World War II, but she did work for the Department of Energy, Scully pointed out. We'll see, Mulder said. The coroner had already wrapped up the charred body in a black plastic bag. The radiation seemed to be alarming everyone at the scene. Mulder went cautiously over and motioned for the coroner to unzip the body bag so we could further study what remained of Nancy Sheck. A man in a general's uniform stood just outside the glass patio door speaking with two policemen, who took copious notes in their small notebooks. The general was short, broad-shouldered, with close-cropped black hair and a swarthy complexion. He appeared deeply distraught. The scene instantly captured Mulder's curiosity. I wonder who that is, Mulder said. 
I heard one of the policemen talking, Scully said. I think he's the one who discovered the body last night. Mulder hurried over, eager to pick up on what the general was saying and to ask a few questions of his own. The concrete was still hot when I got here, the general said, so it couldn't have been long. The back fence was still smoldering, the paint was still bubbling, and the smell... He shook his head. The smell... The general turned to look at Mulder standing beside him, but didn't seem to register his presence. Listen to me. I've seen some combat before, so I've gotten a glimpse of death and how hideous it can be, but not right in our own backyard. Mulder finally managed to read the general's engraved plastic name tag. Excuse me, General Bradukis, did, did you work with Miss Sheck? The general seemed too much in shock to challenge Mulder's right to ask questions here. Yes. Yes, I did. And why were you here last night? The general stiffened, drawing his eyebrows together. We were going to have dinner. Steaks on the grill. His wide face flushed somewhat. Our relationship was not a complete secret, though we were discreet. Mulder nodded, suddenly understanding the general's extra measure of distress. One thing, general... I understand that Ms. Sheck was a fairly important person in the Department of Energy, but when I studied their organizational charts, I couldn't find her program listed on any of them. Had she been transferred recently? Bradukas averted his black eyes. Our, uh, Nancy's work wasn't much talked about. Mulder leaned forward like a hawk swooping in for the kill. Everything depended on the next question. Was Miss Sheck's project connected with something called Bright Anvil? The general reared back like a suddenly startled cobra. I'm not at liberty to discuss that project, especially not here. Mulder gave him an understanding smile. That won't be necessary, general. Bradukas's reaction had been answer enough. The sound Mulder heard in his mind was the clicking of various pieces falling together. Things were still not entirely in place, but at least they were arranged into some semblance of order. He decided his best tactic would be to leave the distraught man alone for now. That's all for me, General. Sorry to have bothered you during this time of great distress. I take it you have an office in the Pentagon. I may come to see you in person if I have further questions. Mulder stepped over to the pool. Half of the water had boiled away in the flash of intense heat, leaving the pool warm and murky with brownish scum collecting in the corners. The fireball must have been utterly intense, yet it had not set Nancy Sheck's large home on fire, nor had it spread to the neighbors' yards. Almost as if it had been directed, intentionally focused in a specific area. Mulder's unusually sharp eye glimpsed an object floating near the bottom of the pool— a small glass bottle that drifted about as if it hadn't yet gotten completely waterlogged. He searched until he found a skimmer. Mulder took it to the edge of the pool and dipped the net deep, swirling it around until he succeeded in snagging the dark object, fishing it out. Water trickled off the edges of the skimmer. I found something here, he called. He lifted free a small vial that contained a black substance. Some pool water had leaked into the vial, but just a few drops. The detective and Scully came over to look. Mulder picked up the small vial, tilting it to the light. The object seemed very odd to him, and by its sheer oddness he decided it must be important to the case. He offered it to Scully, and she took it, shaking it to disturb the contents. I can't say what it is, she said. Some sort of black powder or ash, but how did it get to the bottom of the pool? Could it have something to do with the flash fire? Only one way to find out, Scully, Mulder said. He turned to the homicide detective in charge. We have exceptional analytical facilities at the FBI crime lab. I'd like to take this back with us to run a full analysis. We'll copy you with all the reports, of course. Sure, the detective said. One last thing for my people to do. He shook his head. I've never seen anything like this case, and I think it might be beyond me. Do me a favor and figure this one out. With one hand, the detective brushed his hair back. Sheesh. Give me a stabbing or a drive-by shooting any old day. FBI Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Tuesday, 3.07 p.m. After all her time on the road, Scully was glad to be working in her own lab for a change. 
even if it was on such a gruesome subject as this. She basked in the solitude and familiar surroundings. She knew where all her equipment was located. She knew who to call for help or a technical consultation. She knew other experts whose skills she respected in case she needed an unbiased person to double-check what she herself had found. In mid-afternoon, Scully entered the main lab of Berlina Lou Kwok. Scully clutched a packaged sample of the black residue Mulder had retrieved from Nancy Sheck's backyard pool. I thought I'd fill out the forms in person. Scully handed over the sample along with a note Mulder had written expressing his suspicions as to the identity of the substance. Lou Kwok scanned the words. Interesting, she said. We can check out Agent Mulder's speculations fairly quickly, but if it doesn't match, we could be weeks identifying the substance. Do what you can, Scully said, and thanks. Meanwhile, I've got an autopsy to perform. Lucky you, Lou Kwok said, scrutinizing the powdery sample. It was a messy and exhausting afternoon. Scully completed the autopsy of Nancy Sheck, but now that she had studied two victims who had apparently died from the same bizarre and lethal weapon, she still had no guess as to what the physical cause could have been. It was easy enough to list the cause of death as sudden and violent exposure to extreme levels of heat and radiation, but that still didn't say where such exposure had come from. Was it a new kind of death beam or a pint-sized nuclear warhead? From her own undergrad classes, Scully knew the physics of a nuclear explosion well enough to understand that a warhead could not fit inside, say, a small package bomb or a hand grenade. Critical mass and initiators and shielding required a certain amount of bulk, and such things left debris, none of which had been found at any of the murder scenes. The only piece of trace evidence she had in her possession was the vial of strange black ash Mulder had fished out of Nancy Sheck's swimming pool. Scully heard a knock on the door, and Berlina Luquat came in, holding a folder full of papers. Here are your results. Special delivery for you, Agent Scully. Already? Scully said, surprised. What, you want me to pack it in dry ice and send it UPS? Berlina laughed. Scully gratefully took the folder. But before she could say anything else, Berlina spun about and marched back down the hall. Scully flipped open the biological analysis folder and scanned through the analysis summary paging to the end, interested only in the final result for now. Her stomach sank. The black powdery sample was indeed human ash, almost completely incinerated. Human ash exposed to high radiation, something like forty years ago, mixed with a black grainy sand. Sand, ash, radiation... Scully sat down heavily in her seat and tapped her fingernails on the folder. Then she picked up the phone. She couldn't put it off any further. Mulder was going to love this. Kamita Imports, Honolulu, Hawaii, Tuesday, 12.17 p.m. Inside the Kamita Imports office building, Muriel waited for the receptionist to announce her arrival. Muriel had known Ryan Kamita for a year, she had met him immediately after her own revelations had turned her against nuclear weapons work, transforming her into a vehement protester. The extravagant funding Kamita donated anonymously from the coffers of a successful imports business had kept Stop Nuclear Madness free of financial worries during its entire lifetime. From their first meeting, Muriel realized that she and the scarred blind man had many things in common, eerily so. Still, his very presence sent a thrill of fear through her. She couldn't understand his off-handed acceptance of his tragic fate, but he swept her doubts away with his strange charisma. Once learning of Ryan Kamita's power and his generosity and his personal drive, Muriel had promised herself that she would not come back to this benefactor except under the direst emergency. Circumstances now warranted such a visit. Ryan Kamita emerged from his back offices, he was led by the receptionist, but he maintained only the slightest touch on her shoulder, simply an acknowledgment that he required her to guide him. His eyes were milky, the color of a half-cooked egg. His face was scarred like the bust of a very proud man done by a poorly trained sculptor. Kamita cocked his head to one side, as if he could detect Muriel's presence from the faint perfume in the deodorant soap she used, or the sound of her breathing. Muriel wondered if he had more abilities than he let on. Mr. Kamita, 
she said, standing up. Ryan, it's good of you to see me on such short notice. He came forward, homing in on the sound of her voice and releasing his grip on the receptionist who took his action as a matter of course. Muriel. Muriel Bremen. What a pleasant surprise. It's good of you to come all the way to the islands just to see me. I was about to go to my greenhouse for lunch. Would you join me? Yes, I would, she said. We have certain things to discuss. I'm sorry to hear that, he said. Or am I pleased? No, you're sorry, she said. Definitely sorry. I'm afraid the news is bad, Ryan. She blurted before he even took his seat. Though she had met him accidentally, Muriel somehow held the uncertain suspicion that he had set up the entire encounter himself, and that he was even now playing things out exactly the way he wanted them. She shuddered and hunched her shoulders as she bent over her salad. When she had turned away from her mentor, Emil Gregory, Muriel had looked to Kamita as a new supporter, someone who shared her vehement beliefs. Ryan Kamita knew an enormous amount about nuclear weapons testing, about the entire military industry. He was someone to whom she could divulge the dire designs concocted by unenlightened weapons designers, some of which were passed along to her through a few sympathetic workers who remained at the Teller Research Facility. Muriel had told Kamita everything without qualms about spilling classified information. She had devoted her life to the cause. She had responded to a higher calling, and she knew what she was doing was right. Now the time had come for it all to reach its climax. If they could not stop Bright Anvil soon, then all their efforts were simply smoke blown in the eyes of people who wanted to believe. Everything has failed, Muriel said. The government has a momentum behind what it decides to do, and no one, not me, not you, can stop it once it's started. I take it that means that no one has heard our complaints. Oh, they've heard them all right, Muriel said. They just don't pay attention to them. It's like a gnat buzzing in their ear. The blind man sighed, and his scarred face slumped. Muriel continued. The Bright Anvil test is going ahead anyway, even without Dr. Gregory. Somewhere out in the Marshall Islands, an abandoned atoll. Ryan Kamita sat up sharply, alarmed. I know, he said. Anika Atoll. That's where it will take place. How did you know? she asked, astonished. How could it not take place there? he practically shouted. Our greatest nightmares are about to unfold. The Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia, Wednesday, 10 a.m. Following a hunch, Mulder went to see Nancy Sheck's friend, Brigadier General Matthew Bradukas, in his Pentagon office. The Brigadier General stood from behind his desk and extended a beefy hand. His wide face looked as if it had been deflated of self-confidence. I've been expecting you, Agent Mulder. The general's reddened eyes gave him the appearance of not having slept well in recent nights. Frankly, I thought you would refuse to see me, General, Mulder said. Some people don't want me looking into certain aspects of this murder investigation. On the contrary, Burduka sat back down and squeezed his hands together as if he wanted to pop all his knuckles simultaneously. His face took on a deeply serious expression. Agent Mulder, we both know something highly unusual is going on here. I can't say this in any official capacity, but I think your willingness to accept certain things that others merely laugh at could be a great advantage in this investigation. That got Mulder's attention. General Berdukas continued. I know one of your operating theories in this investigation is that some new weapon under development at the Teller Research Facility was triggered in Dr. Gregory's lab. Believe me when I tell you this, Agent Mulder. I work at the highest levels of the Defense Department. I can tell with utter certainty that no weapon we are currently considering or have under development can do this. So it doesn't have anything to do with Bright Anvil? Mulder asked, fishing. Not in that sense, the General answered, then took a deep breath. What do you mean, not in that sense? Mulder asked. The General sighed. 
Nancy Sheck was in charge of the Department of Energy Oversight on the entire Bright Anvil project, and Dr. Gregory was the lead scientist. The test of the prototype device is scheduled to go off in a small atoll in the Marshall Islands sometime in the next few days. The Anika Atoll has a bit of history of its own, but it's nothing you would have known about. Another hydrogen bomb test took place there in the 50s, though you won't find it in any record book. Sawtooth. It was kept quiet. It took place shortly after we went through such enormous efforts to clear those islanders off Bikini Atoll. In this instance, the scientists and the military were in a hurry, and the island wasn't as thoroughly checked as it should have been. There is some evidence that an entire group of natives was obliterated. My God, Mulder whispered. Sick horror prevented him from saying anything else. The general waited, and finally Mulder said, And you think this, this tragedy on the atoll forty years ago has something to do with these bizarre deaths today? Suddenly he remembered the results of Scully's analysis on the residue in the vial found in Sheck's swimming pool. Human ash, four decades old, and grainy sand, coral sand. The general unfolded his hands again and stared at his fingernails. I didn't suggest any such thing, Agent Mulder. You're free to think what you choose. Why are you telling me all this, he asked. Do you want to make sure someone is caught for Nancy Sheck's death? Braducas looked deeply saddened. That's part of it, he said. But also because I fear for my own safety. Your safety? Why? Nancy was the DOE liaison for the Bright Anvil Project. I am the Department of Defense liaison. I'm afraid I might be next on the list. I'm trying to hide. I've been staying in a different hotel every night. I haven't been home in days, though I'm not sure such measures will do any good. I don't suppose you have any suggestions on how we might stop this thing, Mulder asked. The general flushed again, though more in panic this time than in embarrassment. Bright Anvil itself seems to be the link. Whatever has been awakened or at least triggered into violent action came about because of this impending test. There's no telling how long it's been around, but it became active only recently. Mulder jumped in. Then whatever is going to happen, whatever event these killings are building towards, will probably occur out in the Marshall Islands. That's the only place we can be sure of. He plunged ahead without thinking. General, my partner and I need to be there. I need to be at the site to see what's happening. The general stood up. I'll make a few phone calls. I'll even call Assistant Director Skinner if need be. Just be ready to get on the plane. We don't have any time to lose. Anika Atoll, Marshall Islands, Western Pacific. Wednesday, across the International Dateline. 12.14 p.m. The atoll had recovered remarkably well in 40 years. The low, flat island, little more than a massive coral reef with a shallow dusting of topsoil, was once again burdened with lush tropical vegetation. Fish swarmed in the reefs and lagoons. Birds and butterflies thronged in the foliage above. When Captain Robert Ives had left here four decades earlier... He had been a young, low-grade seaman who had barely learned to shut up and do what he was told. The spectacular sawtooth nuclear test had been the most awe-inspiring sight his slate-gray eyes had ever witnessed. It had reduced Anika Atoll to little more than a hot, blasted scab. Its entire surface sterilized, its coral outcroppings sheared off in the boiling froth of the sea, vegetation crisped, wildlife exterminated. With amazing recuperative powers, nature had rapidly reclaimed the territory that humans had so swiftly and violently snatched away. Once again, Anika Atoll looked like an isolated island paradise, pristine and uninhabited. At least Captain Ives hoped it was uninhabited this time. On the shore of the atoll, sheltered behind the rugged coral rocks that formed the highest point of the island, Bear Dooley and his team members used sailors and Navy engineers to help prepare for their secret test. A small runway was cleared along the straight stretch of beach. 
Bulldozers offloaded from the Dallas plowed through the jungle, scratching narrow access roads from the sheltered control bunker to the lagoon on the far side of the atoll, where the bright anvil device would be set up and detonated. They constructed a bunker to house the controls that would run the small warhead detonation. Because the blockhouse would be so close to the detonation, it had to be incredibly sturdy. Inside the bunker, Bear Dooley supervised the installation of all his test equipment. Dooley listened in on the shortwave radio to regular weather updates for the Marshall Islands. Every time the announcement tracked the approaching tropical depression, now nearly a full-fledged hurricane, he grew ecstatic. It's coming, Dooley had said to Ives the last time he received such news, and we've got a lot of work to do. Timing is crucial. Ives let the man have his way. He had his orders, after all. He didn't think Bear Dooley was even aware of the previous H-bomb test that had taken place in the same area. Dooley didn't seem the type of man who had spent an inordinate amount of time studying history or worrying where things came from. Captain Robert Ives had hoped never to see Anika Atoll again. But now he had returned, for yet another secret nuclear test. Oakland Naval Base, Oakland, California. Thursday, 2.37 p.m. Mulder and Scully arrived in the San Francisco Bay Area, red-eyed and exhausted from all the travel, knowing they had a much longer trip still in front of them. Mulder rented the car, and they drove toward the Oakland Naval Base, then spent the better part of an hour at the gate showing their paperwork, answering questions, and finally arguing with a stoic military policeman who made repeated phone calls to his superiors inside. Exactly where the guard had directed them, they found the whale-sized C-5 transport. Small hydraulic vehicles were hauling cargo, stuffing crates into the swollen, olive-colored belly of the plane. Mulder, carrying his own suitcase and briefcase, walked to the metal steps that led up to the aircraft passenger compartment. I hope we can get ourselves a window seat, he said, non-smoking. I think I'll try and take a nap on the way, Scully answered. Inside the no-frills transport plane, Mulder looked around the sharply shadowed interior, which was lit from behind and below by the open doors in the cargo compartment. Other passengers, naval officers and enlisted men, as well as half a dozen non-military types, moved about finding places to sit. Mulder and Scully searched for a comfortable seat, but all the chairs were hard and stiff-backed. They both buckled in. Guess they don't have a first-class section, Mulder said. He turned around in his seat and recognized some of the civilians already sitting buckled in their seats. Scientists and technicians he had seen at the Teller Nuclear Research Facility. The big transport plane began to lurch along, lumbering into motion like a behemoth, as aerodynamic as a bumblebee, but orders of magnitude louder. The C-5 accelerated down the runway and gracefully lifted off, hauling its enormous bulk into the air with a roar of jet engines. Before long, the aircraft had gained altitude, circled over the hills east of Oakland, and then headed straight out to sea. The aircraft struck heavy turbulence, jouncing the passengers from side to side in their seats. Scully held a white-knuckled grip on the arms of her chair. Mulder nonchalantly chose that moment to lean forward against the bucking carnival ride to pull out his briefcase. He snapped it open on his lap, ransacking it for papers. Mulder studied the tiny fly-speck dots out in the vast blue water off his map. He circled the areas with his finger. I wonder why they're going way out here. The Marshall Islands are a U.S. protectorate, so I'm sure that has something to do with it. Could it be just to intercept the storm? Scully perked up, finally having a subject on which she could discourse. She forced herself to ignore the rocking turbulence as she added her own knowledge to the discussion. It probably has more to do with the track record of nuclear testing out there. The Marshall Islands chain is where most of the U.S. bomb blasts took place between 1946 and 1963. Hydrogen bombs and cobalt bombs, thermonuclear devices, everything too big to set off in Nevada. In fact, between 1947 and 1959, 42 nuclear devices were set off on these islands alone. The entire atoll of Eniwetok was like a hopscotch ground. Test detonations stepped from one clump of islets to another, vaporizing one lump of coral, then the next— the natives were evacuated, promised adequate compensation, but Uncle Sam never really came through for them. 
In fairness, nobody knew exactly what they were doing at the time, not even the weapon scientists. They made mistakes. Some bombs fizzled, others produced a much higher yield than expected. It's amazing to me how they just played with all that destructive potential. Mulder raised his eyebrows. You're sounding pretty passionate there. Is this a particular interest of yours? She looked at him, feeling her walls go up. Used to be. So what happened, he asked. With the testing, I mean. All the atmospheric testing of atomic explosives ceased in 1963 with the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But by that time, over 500 nuclear weapons had already been detonated by the U.S. and various other countries. 500, Mulder said. Above ground? You're kidding, right? She took a deep breath. Mulder waited for her to continue. There's even been an off-and-on moratorium of underground testing, she said. The French and the Chinese and others have continued their own work, although they deny it. The French recently resumed testing out on some other islands near Tahiti, and they've sparked a firestorm of public opinion against them. With seismic surveillance and high-resolution spy satellites, however, it's awfully difficult to mask the signature of a nuclear explosion. Ten to one, this approaching storm isn't just a coincidence, then. Mulder, she said, I think that's a safe bet. Anika Atoll, Marshall Islands, Friday, 4.11 p.m. The bowl of sky surrounding them was a muddy gray-green with the approaching hurricane. The air itself had an ominous ozone crackle mixed with the salty iodine smell of the sea. The wind gusted in short, sharp breezes from random directions. In a sheltered bay farther down the rough shoreline, Scully spotted a small enclosed boat, the captain's gig, used to shuttle crew and materials from the Navy destroyer anchored in view farther out beyond the treacherous reef line. The Navy must be taking this test seriously, she said. That kind of destroyer isn't something to mess with. A trim young officer came directly towards them. You must be the FBI agents, he said, and stood rigidly in front of them. I'm First Officer Lee Clancy. I'll take you to meet Captain Ives. He's here to inspect the last-minute preparations, though I believe he's going to observe the test from the Dallas. We received word from Brigadier General Berdukas in Washington that you'd be VIP guests, though we're all a bit mystified as to your presence here. This isn't an FBI matter as far as I can see. It dovetails with a pending investigation, Scully said. Oh, Clancy answered. We'll take you to the Bright Anvil control blockhouse and let you get on with whatever you need to do. Just try to stay out of the way of the test preparations. Everyone's pretty much going to be working around the clock until the blast goes off. The test is set for 5.15 tomorrow morning. That soon? Mulder said. No choice, Clancy answered as he continued briskly along the beach. Sand whipped around them, stinging their faces. That's when the storm is due to make landfall. The first officer led them to an unusual igloo-shaped control bunker, to which all sorts of generators, air conditioning units, and satellite dishes had been linked. Scully could see many figures moving in and out of the blockhouse, checking generators and electrical connections. A man in a white captain's uniform saw them and waved to Clancy for them to come over. Agents Mulder and Scully, I'm Captain Robert Ives, he said, of the USS Dallas. Now then, I understand that you're here in regards to something unusual about the Bright Anvil test. General Berdukas was reluctant to give details. Is there something we should know about? Scully looked to Mulder, giving him a chance to recount the odd connections and the strange theory he had proposed. But he just looked back at her, not wanting to bring up the possibilities. We're just here to observe and gather a few details, she said. As you may already be aware, there have been several unusual deaths of individuals involved with this test. Just then, Bear Dooley came blustering out of the low door in the blockhouse, blinking his eyes into the wind that blew his long hair and beard around his face. His eyes fixed on the two FBI agents, and his expression gathered a fury equal to the storm brewing around them. He had obviously been stewing about their arrival for some time. I don't know how you two got the authorization to come out here in this restricted testing site, Agents Mulder and Scully. I can't question it, and I can't send you home right now, unfortunately. He planted his hands on his hips. But get this straight from the start. I'm busy. We have a test to run and a device to set off early tomorrow morning. I do not have time to babysit two feds in suits. 
Dooley turned away from them and extended a flapping sheaf of papers towards Captain Ives. New weather projection from overhead satellite feeds, he said, exactly as expected. The hurricane center is only 200 miles out, and it's big enough that there's no chance it'll miss. No chance at all. We're in luck. Anika is going to be whopped tomorrow morning. We're in luck, Mulder repeated. Ives scanned the satellite projection and nodded. Wait a minute, Mulder said. Where is this nuclear device? Is it in one of the crates we flew out with, or is it already set up in the control bunker? Dooley gave a scornful laugh. Asia Mulder, you're not impressing me with your expertise. The blockhouse is supposed to be sheltered from a nuclear blast. Therefore, the device isn't going to be set up anywhere nearby. Logical? The chance to explain things seemed to calm the big engineer. The bright anvil device is on the other side of the island, in a lagoon. And no, you didn't fly out here with it. It came out on the Dallas from San Diego. Everything is all set up and ready to go. Waiting for the storm. Scully spoke up. You've gone to a lot of trouble to make your preparations in secret, and you've taken great pains to select an island that just happens to be directly in the path of a major storm system. Most people with any sense would head away from the typhoon. Do you have any idea how much damage a storm like that can cause? Dooley narrowed his eyes as if about to scold her for a stupidity. Then he let out a gruff laugh. <laughs> of course I do, Agent Scully. Think about it. With all the damage the hurricane is going to cause when it strikes this island, who's going to notice a little more destruction? Anika Atoll, Friday, 6.21 p.m. The weight of the approaching storm felt like a psychological vice gripping Scully. Standing on the rough beach, she looked up at the blackening clouds at sunset, the eerie color of the storm sickened sky. One of the bright anvil technicians came running out of the blockhouse, looking flustered. Captain Ives, sir, there's an emergency message for you over the secure telephone line. Ives looked down at the walkie-talkie on his hip, disconcerted that the message hadn't come to him directly. It's from the Dallas, sir, the technician said. The communication officer on the bridge wants to speak with you. All four of them ducked inside the claustrophobic blockhouse. Scully was glad to get out of the damp wind that made her skin crawl. Captain Ives went to a phone box that had been hastily bolted to a plywood wall inside the armored bunker. Ives here, he said, then listened intently. The expression on his face quickly sagged. What are they doing out in this weather? He waited for an answer. Okay. How far away? He waited again. And we're the only ones within range? He scowled. Hold on. He put his hand to the headset and looked at Dooley. We've just received a distress call, a fishing boat out of Hawaii, Japanese registry. They're in trouble from the typhoon, and the Dallas is the only ship in the vicinity. It's a general May Day, but they're requesting an urgent rescue. We can't ignore it. Dooley heaved a huge sigh. I think we should just leave them out there. Those bozos will get whatever they deserve for coming out here without checking their own weather reports. Mr. Dooley, it's the law of the sea to attempt to rescue whenever another vessel signals distress. It's a law by which I live, and I have spent my entire career on ships. That sort of thing doesn't change just because of your pet project. Dooley glared at him, but didn't seem to know what to do with his own anger. Well, Captain, at least find out who they are and what they're doing out here. These aren't good fishing waters. With a sigh, Captain Ives put the telephone to his mouth again. What's the name of the ship, he said. Find out their registry. As he waited for an answer, suddenly Ives' face turned white. Fakuryu Maru, he said. The lucky dragon? Scully put a finger on her chin, thinking. Lucky dragon, she said. That sounds familiar. Wasn't that... Ives spoke into the phone. Acknowledge their transmission. Tell them we're coming to help. Prepare the Dallas for immediate departure. Ives hung up, then he looked at Scully, since she had been the only one to react to the name. You're thinking of another Japanese fishing boat with the same identification. The vessel that wandered too close to the Castle Bravo H-bomb detonation on Bikini in 1954. The crew all received a huge dose of radiation. The incident caused quite an international scandal. Mulder perked up. 
And now a ship with the same name is straying close to the nuclear test? That can't be a complete coincidence. Scully turned and quickly interrupted his train of thought. Oh, no, you don't, Mulder. Don't even suggest that this is some ghost ship of irradiated Japanese fishermen coming back to stop the bright anvil test. Mulder held up his hands helplessly. I, I didn't suggest any such thing, Scully. I'd say you've got an overactive imagination. He frowned in feigned contemplation. Interesting idea, though. She turned to Captain Ives. Captain, I'd like to go with you out to that fishing boat. She looked at Mulder, asking with her eyes if he wanted to go along. No, thanks, he said. I'll stay on solid ground. I want to keep poking around here. Mulder turned to admonish her as she and Ives headed back out into the freshening wind. Be sure to wear your life jacket. Scully tried to stay out of the way on the bridge deck of the Navy destroyer. Captain Ives directed the helmsman to begin accelerating away from Anika Atoll and into the storm-ragged water, following their charts to where the hapless fishing boat had gotten itself in trouble. Scully attempted to start a conversation several times, but couldn't seem to find the words. Ives appeared deeply troubled and preoccupied, his salt and pepper eyebrows furrowed, his lips pursed and pushing up his mustache. Finally, she blurted out, Captain Ives, you looked shocked when you heard the name of the fishing boat. You don't... You don't think there's anything supernatural about the appearance of this other lucky dragon, do you? At this specific time? Ives smiled faintly. Supernatural? No. It's just a coincidence. For all I know, it could be a common name for Japanese fishing boats, but I'm still not going to let it happen again. The skies darkened like a noose of clouds drawing around them. Before long, the Dallas's forward sensors detected the fishing boat and headed directly toward it. But the lucky dragon looked perfectly intact, not even fighting the waves too much. Nevertheless, Captain Ives hove the Navy destroyer close to the fishing boat. Below, two Asian fishermen stood on deck, drenched with rain and spray, waving their arms for help while another remained in the control house. The boat looks sturdy enough. We should be able to tow the vessel with us back to the atoll, Ives said. Come on, let's get those people on board to safety. Give them warm clothes and some soup. On the fishing boat, two other silhouettes appeared, shadowy figures behind the rain-streaked windows of the bridge deck. As the Navy rescuers crossed over to help the stranded fishermen aboard the Dallas, the other figures emerged. The first was a scarred Hawaiian-looking man who moved carefully. From his milky-white eyes, Scully was sure he was blind. Then the second figure reached for the wet ladder that hung down from the destroyer. Scully gasped with instant recognition as Muriel Bremen climbed up into the rain. USS Dallas, Friday, 9-11 p.m. In the full darkness of early night, the roiling ocean had a greasy cast. No moonlight could penetrate the dense barrier of clouds high above. The wind whistled with a cold metallic tang. Scully shivered as she held the deck rail of the Dallas. She watched the recovery operations on the Lucky Dragon as seamen swarmed aboard the rescued fishing boat. A team of strong young sailors, wet with spray and perspiration, assisted the three fishermen. The scarred blind man and Muriel Bremen as they climbed to relative safety aboard the destroyer. Captain Ives stared in stunned amazement at the blind passenger, unable to tear his gaze from the blistered scars on the man's face. The blank look in his dead eye sockets as the refugee worked his way up the rattling ladder. He reached the deck seemingly impervious to the gathering hurricane force winds. The blind man slowly turned and faced Ives, exactly as if he knew the captain was staring at him. A faint smile rippled across his scarred face. Scully watched the silent encounter, curious, but then turned her attention to Muriel Bremen as the protester came aboard the Dallas. For some odd reason, Scully felt betrayed, felt that Muriel had led her along. Scully's stomach tightened with a sinking feeling as she wondered just what the other woman might have been up to. Muriel hadn't noticed her yet, and Scully spoke sharply into the sound of the wind and waves. You don't expect us to believe this is a complete coincidence, do you, Muriel? Surprised, Muriel Bremen turned toward the voice. Then her long-chinned face compressed with sour anger. So, Agent Scully, it looks like you knew more about Bright Anvil all along. What a sucker I am. 
You were playing me for a patsy, seeing how much I would tell you. I should have known better than to believe an FBI agent. Captain Ives stood next to Scully, looking at Muriel's bedraggled form. You know this person? Yes, Captain. She's a radical anti-nuclear protester from Berkeley. Ives gestured for several of the sailors to come over. Take them all below to one of the empty staterooms each. Get their names and make sure they're comfortable, but don't let them cause any trouble. Things might not be exactly what they seem. He turned sideways to glance at the blind stranger again. The other man stood rigid, with that faint, content smile on his scarred face. We'll contact Mr. Dooley and ask his opinion on the subject. One of the sailors called up from the deck of the Lucky Dragon. Captain Ives, sir? I think you should come down here. We found some interesting items on board that you may wish to inspect. I'd like to go with you, Captain, Scully said. They lowered themselves over the side and climbed down the slick metal ladder to the deck of the fishing boat lashed to the Dallas. One crewman came forward to meet Captain Ives and Scully. All systems appear operational, sir, the young sailor said, raising his voice into the roar of the ocean. No damage that I can see, nothing that should have caused them to send out such an urgent distress call. The ship wasn't in any trouble. Maybe they were just spooked by the storm, Ives said. Scully shook her head quickly. I don't believe they were in any distress at all, she said. They wanted us to go out and pick them up. It was the only way they could be certain of getting to the Bright Anvil test site. Captain Ives worked his jaw but said nothing. Another sailor popped his head out from below decks. Very unusual hull construction, sir, he said. I've never seen a small craft design like this. She's practically armored. I'll bet there's never been a stronger ship this size built. Ives shook his head. Look at this equipment, the nets, all brand new. Those nets have never even been dropped in the water. It's all props, just for show. I think you're right, Agent Scully. Something goes deeper here. Another sailor emerged from the rear cargo compartment. No fish down here, sir. No cargo at all. Just a few supplies and one storage barrel. Storage barrel, I've said. What's in it? I thought you might want to take the top off yourself, sir, just in case it turns out to be something important. Ives took a screwdriver from the sailor and popped the lid off. He froze. Nothing, he said. Just powdery dirt, black ash of some kind. Scully carefully reached in and touched the ash, bringing out a pinch between her fingertips. She smeared it around, feeling the greasy and grainy texture. It seemed identical to the residue in the small vial found in Nancy Sheck's pool. No, it's not from an incinerator, she said. But I think this provides direct, clear-cut evidence that Muriel Bremen is more involved than she claims to be in the murders of Bright Anvil personnel. Anika Atoll, Saturday, 2.20 a.m. Later, when Scully returned to her own cabin for a brief rest, Captain Ives appeared at her door. Wonders never cease, he said, bracing himself against the door frame as the ship rocked. I've finally gotten through to Bear Dooley on the atoll. I couldn't tell whether he was outraged or just hopping excited to learn that Muriel Bremen and her friends had come out here. So what did he ask us to do? Ives shook his head in disbelief. He wants us to escort them all to the blockhouse so they can be present during the test. Scully shook her head. They do enjoy playing their games, don't they? All right, how are we getting over there? I'm staying here on the Dallas, the captain answered. The wind wall of the storm is approaching, and the gale is due to hit maximum force within the next three or four hours. I can't leave my ship. I'm not comfortable having my captain's gig there at the atoll, but First Officer Clancy is going to ferry it back here. So we'll have to wait for the return trip, Scully asked. By now, Mulder would be wondering what had happened to her. Probably having uncovered many details of his own that he needed to share. Most likely preposterous explanations of supernatural manipulation or alien interference in nuclear weapons development. She could never tell what he might come up with. Actually, it's more unorthodox than that, Captain Ives said. 
He stood tall and straight, his feet oddly close together as if he were a statue. Miss Bremen suggested we take the Lucky Dragon. Two of my seamen will pilot her, although the fishermen want to go along as well. It seems everybody feels like joyriding through this typhoon. He shook his head. The Lucky Dragon easily rode the swells, pulling away from the Dallas and heading directly toward Anika Atoll. The boat handled well, according to the seamen Captain Ives had assigned to shuttle it over. During the brief ride out to the island, Muriel Bremen remained with Ryan Kamita, avoiding Scully. The blind man appeared disoriented and agitated, as if afraid of something or overwhelmed by circumstances. Scully wondered what had caused his blindness, the terrible burn scars. She didn't think he could possibly be a Nagasaki survivor. He looked too young, too exotic, too strange. As the fishing boat rowed up to the shore and anchored in the shallow, sheltered lagoon, Scully spotted Mulder waiting for her at the door of the control blockhouse, waving his arms. His wet suit jacket flapped about in the wild wind. Bear Dooley shuffled out of the blockhouse, looking haggard and flustered from his nonstop preparations. The test was due to go off in less than three hours. He stood with his hands on his waist, staring at Muriel Bremen as she stepped off the boat onto Anika Atoll. Muriel helped Ryan Kamita step onto the beach, but the scarred man dropped to his hands and knees, not in collapse, but more like an embrace of the crushed coral and sand. He looked up, and Scully saw tears leaking out of his ruined eyes. Muriel stood next to him, a hand supportively squeezing his shoulder. Finally, she directed her gaze towards Bear Dooley. Oh, Muriel, glad to see you could join us, Dooley boomed. You didn't have to go through so much trouble. You could have just asked, and we would have included you among our crew. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a part of that crew, Bear. Not under the circumstances. Muriel's voice was uninflected, without barbs. Scully thought she sounded defeated, resigned. The bright anvil test would indeed go off, despite the protesters' efforts to stop it. Scully wondered just how far she had intended to go. From below decks on the Lucky Dragon, the three fishermen scrambled up, hauling the half-full barrel of ash uneasily between them. They nervously carried the metal barrel ashore. Dooley gestured toward them. You're not taking that inside my blockhouse, he said. Ryan Kamita lifted his head and turned a tear-streaked, burned face towards Muriel and then Bear Dooley. Let them leave it where it is. Relieved, the fishermen hurried into the shelter of the blockhouse, ducking from the onslaught of slicing rain. Muriel, why don't you come inside and I'll show you around our lush quarters, Dooley said. I'm sure you'll remember some of the things. Trying to rub my face in it, Bear? she asked. He blinked his small eyes. No, I don't think so, he said. Most of these engineers don't know what I'm talking about half the time, and you at least understand. For old time's sake, for Emil Gregory, come and take a look at Bright Anvil. Reluctantly, she tapped Kamita's shoulder, trying to get him to come along. Mulder looked at Scully, but she watched the blind man shake his head. Let me stay out here for a while longer, Ryan Kamita said. I will be fine. Maria looked uneasy about leaving him there alone, until Scully stepped forward. We'll stay with him for a few minutes, Muriel. Muriel nodded before following Bear Dooley and the seamen inside the control blockhouse. On the beach, Kamita dug his scarred fingers into the sand, smelling the coral and the water and the spray. He tilted his head up to the greenish-black hurricane clouds. He breathed through his mouth and closed his blind eyes as he sat back, clenching his fists and gritting his teeth. The blind man turned a scarred face, fixing his unseeing gaze to a point directly between Mulder and Scully. You hope to find answers, he said. Do you have any? Mulder said. At the moment, we're not even sure which questions we should be asking. You shouldn't be asking questions, Kamita said. You shouldn't be here at all. You could become innocent bystanders, casualties of war. 
His chin twitched downward just a fraction. As he sat outside on the beach, the waves crashed against the reef line out beyond the lagoon, and Ryan Kamita spoke with the voice of a ghost in the wind. I was born here on Anika, as were all of my people, a small tribe. We lived here. Although legends tell us we came from other islands on a long pilgrimage, we stayed here. It was our place. It was peaceful. But Anika Atoll is uninhabited, Scully said. Yes, Kamita answered. Yes, now it is uninhabited. But forty years ago it was our home. That was a time when the United States was walking tall, striding across the world, proud in its new status as a superpower. You had atomic weapons in your pocket, and you were still flushed with pride over your victory in World War II. But your own atomic bombs weren't big enough, so you had to build fusion bombs, hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear warheads. And in building such bombs, you had to test them in places where no one would care. Places such as Anika Atoll, my home as a child. Scully looked sidelong at Kamida. She said, I know the islanders on Bikini and Eniwetok were displaced to other homelands when the atolls were evacuated for nuclear tests. Is that what happened to your people? Kamita shook his head. The government didn't bother with that. I was only a young boy, probably about ten. I have since learned that the name of the test was Sawtooth. I had grown up here, primitive and uneducated, some might say, while others would call it idyllic. An existence in paradise with fine weather and warm climate most of the time. In the reef rocks around my islands there were many caves, small outcroppings and hollows that, had they been underwater, would have been the homes of moray eels and octopuses. But above grounds they provided an opening for me to worm my body through, to go down into tide pools and mysterious mazes, half-submerged treasure houses where I could find mussels and conch shells and abalone. My parents would wait above with my older sisters and my uncles as I wiggled down into the reef caves to search for delicacies. Kamita's rough face wore a half-smile. I remember it so clearly. Memories are all I have been able to see for most of my life. A blast of wind curled around the coral uplift that sheltered the blockhouse and slapped down at them. Scully rocked back to keep her balance. Mulder grasped her shoulder. Ryan Kamita didn't seem to notice the gust at all. We knew the strange navy ships had been cruising around our islands, long metal monstrosities bristling with spines. The sailors had landed in their white uniforms, but we hid in the jungles, thinking they were invaders from some other island. If they were trying to locate and evacuate the inhabitants of Anika, they did not search very hard. We were afraid of them, but also curious. We didn't know why they had placed strange machines on our island, unusual structures, amazing blinking substations and other devices. It was magic to us. Evil magic. This is the end of side three. He picked up a fistful of wet sand, letting it trickle through his scarred fingers. I remember that day. Many of my cousins had gone to inspect the device the soldiers had left behind. Others watched the battleships pull away. But I had my day's work to do. My father insisted that the water level was perfect for me to find special treasures in the caves, and so I crawled deep within the winding passages, carrying only a small knife and a net in which to store the shells that I found. I had secured a large abalone, enough for an entire meal, I thought, and a few other shells. When I crawled back up the cave, my father waited for me, standing out in the sunlight. I could see him towering above the opening of the cave. I held up the net that contained the shells. He bent down to take it from me so that I could climb out of the cave. I looked into his eyes. 
They were cast into shadow as he leaned toward me. Kamita paused, his voice hitched. And then the sky turned white, a burning white, a blaze of heat so hot and so fast that it wiped everything clean, blasted every molecule of color from the world. The last thing my eyes ever saw was my father's silhouette, fuzzy around the edges where I could see right through his skin. For the barest fraction of a second, I could clearly make out the bones inside his body as the radiation poured through him until the rest of the shockwave blew him to ashes. And then the light engulfed me. Scully stared at him, wide-eyed, her hand to her mouth in horror. Somehow, I survived, Kamita continued. The shockwave was immense, but I tumbled back down into the caves even as the nuclear detonation flattened my island. The water inside the caves boiled and blasted upward like a geyser. My skin was cooked as if I were a roasting pig. A long time later, I found myself alive and outside of the caves. Much of the reef overhead had been vaporized. I had been spared, though it was no blessing. No blessing at all. I felt my way along the hot, steaming rock. I found the lagoon, but it was still boiling hot, scalding my legs, which were already too burned to feel any more pain. I walked and waded out to sea, unable to see anything. Still, I continued sloshing farther and farther from the island. They say I made it two miles before I was picked up. Picked up? Mulder said. Who picked you up? Navy ship, Kamita said. Sailors, men assigned there to observe the sawtooth test. They didn't know what to do with me. After their immense technological victory, my survival must have been quite an embarrassment to them. Kamita stared deeply into his memories for a moment, his eyes too blind to see the present. After I had recovered, they placed me in the care of an orphanage in Honolulu. They changed all the records, and I survived. Oh yes, I survived, and in later years I made a name for myself. I became lucky. I was talented in business. I have become a wealthy man over the past forty years. You'll find no record of the sawtooth nuclear test, or of my people now annihilated, or even of me, the lone survivor of a test the government would prefer to forget. But if there's no record and you were such a young boy, Scully said, how did you get all of this information? How can you remember and be sure of the details? Kamita gave her a blind gaze that so unnerved her she looked away in embarrassment. His hollow voice sent a shudder down her spine. Because I've been reminded time and again, the spirits of my people, they come and speak to me. They tell me not to forget them or my own past. Scully sighed and looked at Mulder, but he ignored her. In other words, your people were annihilated in this secret atomic bomb test, and because you're the only survivor, you can speak to their spirits? Scully stood up, ready to leave the man to his delusions. Mulder, we should get inside the shelter. Think of it, my friend, Kamita said to Mulder. The blind man seemed to know intuitively who was most likely to swallow his story. For four decades they have been gathering energy. Their screams have finally reached a peak to deafen those who brought this upon them and those who would do it again. Scully caught the meaning of his words. Do you mean to say that these ghosts have been killing nuclear weapons researchers and other people who had a connection to the atomic bomb? Agent Scully, Kamita said, I will confess that I bear the responsibility for the death of Emil Gregory. I had hoped that removing him would bring this test to a halt, but I was wrong. It was too simplistic. I was also responsible for the death of a Department of Energy executive, a woman behind the funding for the Bright Anvil Project. 
Without her support, this test could not have taken place. But I have waited too long. I have held the ghosts in check for too many months, too many years, and now they're growing restless, striking even those I have not designated, those they believe are in some way a threat to our island. Their attention expands. They grow very restless, but in a few hours they will fulfill their destiny and protect this island again. The storm continued to grow into a persistent roar. Scully touched Kamita's elbow, raising him to his feet. It's not safe to be out here. We need to get inside, all of us. Safe? Kamita laughed. Safety is a luxury none of us can afford now. I'm telling you this, Agent Mulder, just so you have the answers. You are a curious man, but none of us will get out of this alive. He cocked his head to stare up into the storm as if calling to something. He spoke in a mystical whisper. At last the wave of fire will reach the shore of death. Anika Atoll, Saturday, 4.15 a.m. As the howling darkness engulfed the island, Scully and the others huddled in the blockhouse. Bear Dooley paced the control chamber and triple-checked every diagnostic system on the equipment racks, then went through the entire routine again. He flashed repeated suspicious glances at Ryan Kamita and the three Japanese fishermen, who were seated at a table that had been cleared of all papers and reports. Don't touch anything, he said. Just stay there and keep your hands to yourselves. Dooley studied the big round dial of the watch strapped to his wrist. It's 4.15, he announced. Only one hour to go. Muriel? I'd really like you to be a part of the team again at long last, he said. Without a meal, this whole project nearly fizzled. When we lost you, we lost our greatest contender. I've been doing my damnedest to keep everything working and running on schedule, but that's not what I'm good at. I'm no match for you but I'm not going to walk away from my responsibilities. I'm going to see that Bright Anvil goes off as planned, because that's my job. I'm disappointed in you, Bear, Muriel said. His face fell as if that were the worst thing she could have said to him. She remained standing, formal and rigid, one step away from the instrument racks. I know you want to test this new weapon system in a real-use situation, but I wish you'd let it bother you just what that real use may end up being once Bright Anvil is weaponized. The only advantage it has over the hydrogen bombs and the enormous thermonuclear warheads we stockpiled in the past was that they were too destructive for any sane government to consider using. Muriel became more animated, waving her hands in front of her. But Bright Anvil gives us precise annihilation, clean destruction. It terrifies me to think that the United States may have a brand new warhead it won't be afraid to use. Muriel, Dooley said sharply, cutting off her lecture, I wouldn't want anyone but a professional mechanic to try and fix my car. It's the government's job to use these weapons responsibly. He said, blinking his eyes, rapidly as if grains of sand had gotten in them. You have to trust the government, he repeated. They know what's best for us. Mulder looked over at Scully, with his eyebrows raised and an amazed expression on his face. Anika Atoll, Saturday, 4.25 a.m. Just then, the heavy door to the blockhouse ripped open with a siren blast of wind. Howling rain pelted nearly horizontally like bullets of water in a shotgun spray. Two bedraggled and shell-shocked sailors staggered in, gasping, they worked together to swing the door shut, bolting it into its jam. They were sopping wet, their uniforms yanked and disarrayed by the violence of the typhoon. Okay, everybody's inside. Generator's functioning properly, said one sailor. It's sheltered from the rain and the wind, and it should hold up even if the typhoon gets worse. The center of the wind wall is approaching. Dooley nodded, speaking gruffly. It better keep functioning. That power source is running all our diagnostics. If that fails, this whole test will be a bust even if Bright Anvil does go off as planned. Dooley strutted around like a tiger in a cage. He glanced at the chronometer. Forty-three more minutes, he said. 
While the technicians remained intent on their stations, Mulder watched the scarred blind man who had told him such a fantastic story only hours earlier. After adding Ryan Kamita's tale to the details of the mystery as he saw it, Mulder began formulating a hypothesis that fit all the information. It began to make complete, if fantastic, sense to him. He pondered how best to broach the subject with his partner. I've been thinking, Scully. If what Mr. Kamita says is true, then we could be dealing with some sort of psychic shockwave. Just imagine the entire population of islanders here, all together, unsuspecting, living out their normal lives, and then suddenly and unexpectedly catapulted across the brink of death by one of the most powerful instantaneous blasts ever recorded. Isn't it possible that such a blast could have acted as some sort of a boost to a higher level of existence? Mulder, if the energy of an atomic blast can somehow turn its victims into... She searched for words, then shrugged into a vengeful collection of radioactive ghosts with superpowers, then how come there aren't a hundred thousand phantom juggernauts running around after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki blasts? The fat man and little boy warheads produced just a fraction of the power unleashed in the hydrogen bombs that were detonated out here on the Pacific Islands, Mulder said. Maybe the Hiroshima and Nagasaki blasts weren't quite enough to cross that threshold. Scully looked at him seriously. And you're telling me that this collection of ghosts is hunting down people originally involved in the development of nuclear weapons and the individuals in charge of the Bright Anvil test and assassinating them out of revenge? Maybe revenge, Mulder said. Or maybe they're just trying to prevent the test from continuing. Everything points towards stopping the Bright Anvil test, which could well be the start of a whole new series of above-ground blasts. What if these ghosts are trying to prevent what happened to them from ever happening again? Scully shuddered. Mulder supposed that if he had made the same proposal in the light of day in the cool shelter of the offices at FBI headquarters or any place else that seemed safe, she might have scoffed at his reasoning. But here, in the darkest hour before dawn, surrounded by the brooding hurricane force winds out on a deserted Pacific island, any sort of creepy story had a greater ring of truth. Mulder suddenly had another thought. The ashes! He spun around to see that Ryan Kamita sat placidly at the analysis table, his scarred hands folded atop the smooth formica surface. His ravaged face was directed toward them. He wore a mysterious smile as if amused at Mulder's explanation. He looked like he had heard every word. Mulder hurried over to him. The, the ashes, what, what were those ashes all about, Mr. Kamita? The blind man nodded briefly. I think you know the answer, Agent Mulder. Those were the ashes of the victims from your island, weren't they? You're using them as as, uh, as signal flags or, or magnets to draw the attention of the ghosts. Kamita turned his face down towards his folded hands. When I grew older and accustomed to my blindness, after I had developed connections and earned plenty of money, I came back here to Anika Atoll. The spirits of my people had told me their story, told me my life, told me over and over again what had happened here until I was mad with the repetition. I had to come home for my own sanity. I spent many days here on the reefs, crawling over this abandoned atoll that had grown its own jungle back again. I was blind, but I knew where to go. I knew where to look because the voices guided me. I gathered as much of the ash as I could. It seemed a pitifully small amount, all that remained of an entire island population. But it was enough for my purposes, and theirs. When I was ready, I sent samples of the ash like a calling card to those people who needed to receive it. And you sent a vial of that ash to Nancy Sheck? Scully asked. Ryan Kamita nodded. And to Emil Gregory. The spirits didn't really need the ash. Left to themselves, they could find their own targets. But it helped, and it helped me to direct them. Mulder felt sick with horror. Nancy Sheck and the others received only a tiny vial of that ash, but you brought an entire barrel with you here to this island. It is all I have left, Kamita said. It will bring them all here.
All of them. Finally. Just then the phone rang. Victor Ogilvy grabbed it. His eyes widened as he craned his head deep into the phone headset, as if he had difficulty making out distinct words from the transmission. Bear, Victor said, clinging to the telephone, staring at it with his mouth partially open. Bear, that was a communication from Captain Ives. He said their radar systems aboard the Dallas just picked up something big and powerful approaching the atoll. He didn't know what it was. It, it was like nothing he'd ever seen before. Victor swallowed, waving the phone headset. And then his transmission cut off entirely. I, I can't raise him. What the hell is going on here? Dooley bellowed. We've only got 35 minutes until detonation. We can't afford screw-ups now. Then all of the power went out in the blockhouse, plunging them entirely into blackness. USS Dallas, Saturday, 4.30 a.m. Captain Robert Ives didn't know how he could possibly remain standing in the turmoil, but a captain wasn't supposed to fall on his butt on the bridge of his own ship, not even at the height of a typhoon. With his legs set widely apart, he rode the churning roller coaster of waves. Fists of rain pummeled the bridge windows, and the sickly greener sky seemed filled with an unnatural light. He checked his wristwatch, knowing it couldn't possibly be dawn. Not yet. The eerie glow made his skin crawl. Ives had seen hurricanes before, and they had always seemed otherworldly, but none more so than this one. Wind wall levels reaching 115 miles per hour, sir, Clancy shouted from his first officer station. That's well beyond the maximum expected levels for this storm. Something's pumping it. How far away is the eye? Ives asked. We don't expect it to break through for another half hour, and then we'll get a little coffee break. For the time being, we just have to hold on. Already done, sir, Clancy said. How much longer till Bright Anvil goes off? Thirty-eight minutes, sir, answered one of the tactical crewmen. A foamy wall of water slammed into the side of the Dallas, making the entire hull ring like a struck gong. The battleship listed starboard, then slowly righted herself like a killer whale regaining its balance. Captain Ives held on, riding the motion. He was glad the lucky dragon was no longer tied to their hull. Captain, the tactical officer shouted, I'm picking up something on forward radar. There's, my God, I can't believe it. It's, it's so big. What is it? Ives said, swiveling around and nearly losing his balance. Give me details. The tactical officer remained at his station, peering down at the flickering screen. The thing is huge, and it has extremely high energy. It's, it's heading this way. I don't understand these readings, sir. An electrical storm? A, a, a power surge? Contact the Bright Anvil team on shore, Ives said, with a deep sense of foreboding. Let them know. He lowered his voice so that no one else heard his words. Maybe it'll give him time to prepare. Ives whirled to look through the rain-splattered bridge windshield. He saw a sickening, washed-out glow across the waves, like a fire far out on the water. It reminded him of a miniature but extremely intense sunrise coming out of nowhere. There it is, Clancy said, pointing, as if Ives himself couldn't see. What is that thing? It's, it's like an inferno. As the bridge crew watched, the wall of light grew into a spherical barrier that rushed towards them brighter and brighter, even through the murky air of the hurricane. Ives had seen something very much like this several times at nuclear tests back in the 1950s. The light and the shape of an H-bomb explosion was something he could never forget. And now it came toward him again. Ives grabbed the hydrophone at his captain's station and punched the full ship intercom. All hands, brace for impact! The blaze of radioactive light hurtled towards them, riding the crest of a sharp boiling wave, a line of angry seawater that churned up and vaporized with the heat and force of a holocaust. Ives stood at his captain station, staring helplessly out the window. He had no eye protection, but he knew deep inside his clenched stomach that nothing would make any difference at the moment. So he stared and kept staring as the force slammed into them. The last thing his eyes registered before his optic nerve surrendered to the onslaught was the sharp bow of his heavily armored Navy destroyer slumping, melting as the steel plate vaporized. Then the wall of light and fire swallowed the Dallas whole. 
Anika Atoll, Saturday, 4.40 a.m. In the sudden black chaos following the power outage in the blockhouse, Molda grabbed one of the emergency flashlights mounted on the wall. He switched on the beam, hoping that its illumination would restore calm to the seamen and technicians there. Instead, he witnessed Bear Dooley and the other Bright Anvil engineers scrambling around, blindly trying to rescue their subsystems. Somebody get that generator restarted, Dooley roared. We'll lose all our data if it's not up in half an hour. But we just checked the generator, one of the bedraggled sailors said. It was working fine. Excuse me, Bear, Victor Ogilvy said, his thin voice quivering with anxiety. I don't think it's just the generator. This phone is battery powered and it had a full charge, but I can't raise the Dallas. I can't even get a whisper of static. It's dead. Everything's dead. All the control panels, all powered, not even our secondary systems. But what could drown out everything like that? Dooley asked. What sort of accident did this typhoon cause? No accident, Muriel Bremen said in a calm, strong voice. Bear, you know what can cause those effects. Dooley swung his head towards Muriel, his face open and trembling as uncertainty set in. I don't know what you're talking about. She looked squarely at him. Electromagnetic pulse, Muriel said. An EMP? But how? That, that would require a... He suddenly looked at the protester in horror. An airburst. A nuclear airburst, but... What if somebody else was using this hurricane as a cover for another test? Oh, my God, I can't believe it. Somebody else detonated a device. That's what Captain Ives picked up on his radar. Somebody else is stealing our show. It may not have such a facile explanation, Muriel Bremen said coldly. It may not be something you can understand at all, Bear. Don't try to spook me, Dooley shouted back at her. I don't have time for this right now. Behind him, Mulder heard the clank of a deadbolt being thrown, a latch raised. Then the heavy armored door to the blockhouse blasted inward, and the storm exploded inside the confined chamber. Papers flew into the air on a whirlwind. In the eerie light of the storm outside, Mulder saw a silhouetted form in the doorway, pushing himself outside into the jaws of the typhoon. Ryan Kamita had let himself out. It is time! He shouted back at them. They're coming! Then, as if drawn by an invisible chain, the blind man plunged out into the ravening storm. Ryan, no! Muriel Bremen screamed. Kamita turned back towards her for just a moment before the winds and the darkness swallowed him up. Don't just stand there, Bear Dooley squawked. Get that damn door shut! Muriel Bremen stared stricken at the doorway through which Kamita had just vanished. The other team members appeared nervous, but Dooley only scowled. Mulder watched as two Navy engineers wrestled with the heavy door, pressing their shoulders against it and shoving into the battering ram of wind. Silence fell like stone in the darkened control blockhouse. He was surprised to see Muriel Bremen standing rigid, holding on to one of the control racks for support. He thought she'd have argued to rescue her friend, but the protester said nothing, appearing resigned to his fate and terrified of her own. It's what he wanted, she muttered. The light of a second flashlight made a weird bobbing glow inside the blockhouse. Technicians scrambled to restore their equipment to get the backup generator jump-started. How do we know the equipment out of that device is functioning? Victor Ogilvy asked, blinking owlishly in the shadows and harsh light. What if the countdown is frozen because of another dead battery? The EMP could have wiped out everything over there, too. We have no proof of any other electromagnetic pulse, Gully said. Dooley tugged at his hair in a comical gesture. The device itself has a completely different power source, hardened against all accidents, rough weather, and even handling by Navy personnel, he said. Bright Anvil is one robust sucker. Distraught, Bear Dooley rounded on Muriel, seeking a target to blame. 
This is your fault, Muriel, he said. You came to Anika of your own free will, and I welcomed you. But you've performed some kind of sabotage. What did you do to the generators? You've been trying to stop this test since the very beginning. I did nothing, Muriel said. Or maybe I didn't do enough. But we'll see. The Bright Anvil test will not take place. Not this morning. Not ever. It's out of my hands. We're all going to be obliterated, she muttered. The wave is coming, a flash fire, a wall of cleansing rage from the Anika ghosts. It's already hit the Dallas, and it'll be here next. Mulder went to her side. You knew about this? You knew it was going to happen? She nodded. Ryan told me it would. But I have to admit, she gave a short, bitter laugh. A good part of me never actually accepted it. But now it's all... It's all just the way he said it would be. She drew a heaving breath. At least Bright Anvil's going to be stopped, one way or another. All the test material will be wiped out of here, along with the project people. In the wake of this disaster, I doubt such a weapon will ever come about again. Her eyes wide, Scully looked at Mulder, and then at Muriel. I can't believe what you're saying. You honestly think a cloud of atomic ghosts is going to come and stomp on the Bright Anvil test because they won't condone another nuclear explosion here? Muriel just looked at her without answering, and Scully let out a long breath of disbelief. She turned to Mulder in exasperation. I think that's exactly what's going to happen, Scully, he said, surprising her. I believe it. We're sitting ducks if we don't get away from here. The three fishermen from the Lucky Dragon stood up, looking extremely agitated. We don't want to stay here any longer, the leader said, waving his hands in front of him. This place is a death trap. It's a target. We're fools to stay in this place. A second fisherman pleaded with Mulder as if the FBI agent were in charge. We want to take our chances, get back on our boat, Scully said. You can't go out in a boat in the middle of a hurricane. It's safer to stay here. All three of the fishermen shook their heads vehemently. No, it's not safer. This place is death. Mulder said, You told me yourself, Scully, that their boat's been heavily reinforced, designed to withstand travel through a heavy storm. Muriel Bremen nodded. Yes, Ryan wanted to make sure we could make it out here. But I don't know if he had any intention of going back. I don't think so. Bear Dooley stormed around, still looking for something to break. Go on out in the storm, all of you, for all I care. Get away from me. We've got work to do. There's still a chance we can bring this test off. The device is on the other side of the island, and the countdown is going to proceed whether we get these diagnostics up or not. Mulder looked at Scully and in his heart he felt an absolute certainty of what was going to happen. The fisherman went to the blockhouse door and worked the bolt to open it. Dooley stood ranting at them. You're all insane! Mulder knew that Scully probably agreed with him. Come on, Scully. Mulder gestured as he ran to the door. You've got to go with us. Mulder, no! she shouted, looking torn. The door finally blew open and the storm roared in but the winds had already disturbed everything loose that could possibly blow around. Now, though, the voice of the whirlwind had a different quality, almost like human speech, wailing screams growing louder and coming closer. With the fisherman beside him, Mulder stood at the threshold, nearly blown back by the storm's force. He looked out at the awesome clouds that hung like sledgehammers ready to pound the island. He could see that far beyond just the brooding presence of the typhoon, something terrible, truly terrible, was coming their way. Scully continued resisting, until Mulder finally dragged her close enough to the door so that she could look out. She protested again until she stared into the night and looked up at the sky. Then all her objections evaporated on her lips. Anika Atoll Saturday, 4.54 a.m. The storm spoke to him in its power. Dreadful voices for those others. Welcoming whispers for him. At last. Ryan Kamita was part of them. 
a member of the spectral group, yet he was the misfit, not because he was blind or scarred, but because he was alive. He staggered away from the control bunker, bumping into winds that slapped him with the force of a catapult driving him back, but still he ran. His feet slipped on the rough rock and sand that the gale flung around him like shrapnel. Kamita stumbled, fell to his hands and knees, felt his numb fingers digging into the cold, wet beach. He wanted to let it suck him down, to draw himself into the sand to become one with the ashes of his people, a part of the scarred atoll. I'm here, he shouted. They were coming. High up on the beach, Kamita tripped over the barrel left there by the fisherman. Instinctively, unerringly, he had blindly found his way to the metal drum filled with the ashes of his family and his tribe. He embraced the barrel, holding onto it as if it were an anchor, sobbing as the hurricane roared around him. The eerie whispers and screams behind the wind grew louder and louder, drowning out even the storm in the congealing mass of clouds overhead. Ryan Kamita could feel the power growing in the accusing eye of the hurricane, a static electricity, a surge of energy. Though he was blind, he somehow knew that in the clouds around the island, a searing light built to a screaming intensity, growing brighter as the countdown for Bright Anvil continued to zero. Anika Atoll, Saturday, 5.10 a.m. Facing into the storm, Mulder kept hold of Scully's arm to be sure they wouldn't lose each other. They staggered through the blinding rain and clawing winds that threatened to tear their small group apart. The three fishermen led the way, trudging one step at a time with heads down, making their way down to the sheltered lagoon. Mulder could not see Ryan Kamita anywhere. Mulder, this is crazy, Scully shouted. I know, he said, but kept going. Muriel Bremen plodded beside them, stunned yet willing to escape, not so ready after all to die for her cause that she would give up this last chance to get away. No matter what else you believe, Mulder, Scully had to yell in his ear just to be heard. The bright anvil device is going to go off in a few minutes. If we don't get far enough away, we'll be caught in that shockwave. I know, Scully, I know, but his words were snatched away by the storm, and he didn't think she heard him. The fishermen began shouting, their calls barely discernible in the ripping gale. Two of them waded out into the churning water of the shallow, protected cove to where the lucky dragon had slipped part way into deeper water. The lead fisherman swung himself aboard, grabbing handholds and climbing the wet rocking hull to reach the deck. He helped his companions get aboard, and they gestured for the others to wade out to them. They didn't have much time. They all reached the fishing boat and scrambled onto the deck of the Lucky Dragon. One fisherman ran to the deckhouse and started the engines. The fishing boat spun about with its powerful engines, churning up a waterspout of spray as it headed directly into the heart of the hurricane. Mulder stood on the deck next to Scully and Muriel Bremen, holding onto the rail for dear life and turning back to look towards the island. The clouds glowed and hissed and boiled with weird energy that made all the hairs on his arms and neck stand up. He glanced at his watch, any moment now, and it would all be over, one way or another. The boat crashed away from the atoll, threading through the rabid whitecaps that foamed around the treacherous reefs near the surface. At the controls, the fishermen guided the vessel, swerving from side to side, searching for a safe passage. Finally, the waters opened up, deeper and bluer even in the storm's gloom. The engine roared with renewed power and the lucky dragon lurched ahead. Mulder looked out to sea but could find no trace of the huge navy battleship. He saw only a roiling froth that may have been a secondary maelstrom caused by the hurricane itself. Or it could have been the sinking remnants of a massive shipwreck. Then, with a searing flash on the far side of the island, a small sun came up. It rose, hot and yellow, blasting back the hurricane for just a moment. It's bright anvil, Scully said. Look at it. So the thing worked, Muriel Bremen said, loud enough to be heard but in a voice stunned into relative quiet. The bright anvil blast, though, seemed to be a catalyst for that other force lurking within the hurricane clouds. 
With the test detonation, the eerie brightness increased a thousandfold, dropping out of the mass of thunderheads. A smothering blanket of caustic fire engulfed the far smaller test blast and crushed it, extinguishing the new light. But the blinding supernatural fire drew on the power and became stronger, more animated. Like a living thing with a purpose, the crackling, blazing swarm of atomic victims plunged over the surface of Anika Atoll. The radioactive backwash incinerated the jungle that had regrown in 40 years and vaulted the high coral mound that had shielded the control blockhouse. As the lucky dragon continued its race into the hurricane, the spectral blaze on the atoll reached a final pitch, and the bone-chilling screams became more distinct in the wind. Then another voice joined theirs. Mulder thought he clearly recognized the voice of Ryan Kamita, his own triumphant shout joined with those of his family and his people as they all came together in one binding destructive force, a force whose mission had now been accomplished. The glow died away on Anika Atoll, leaving it sterile and barren, simmering with leftover heat and scoured clean of all life. The lucky dragon shot onward into the fury of the storm. FBI Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Tuesday, 1.49 p.m. Agent Scully sat at her computer terminal in her small cubicle. She was relieved to be back in Washington, D.C., for a few days at least. Going through the familiar motions, tidying up the details, usually helped her to resolve a case in her mind. To sift through the questions and line up the explanations, putting any remaining uncertainties to rest. She sifted through her notes, scanned another sheet of paper, double checked a press release, and went back to her typing. The U.S. Navy has released information that the Spruance class destroyer, the USS Dallas, sank due to the unexpectedly severe force of the typhoon that struck the Marshall Islands early Saturday morning. All hands on board were lost. According to the National Weather Service, this hurricane was one of the most unusual such storms on record, both for its odd and unpredictable motion and for its unexpected intensity, particularly within the vicinity of Anika Atoll. Rescue teams arriving at Anika found no survivors among the members of the Bright Anvil team. No bodies were recovered, which the Navy notes is not surprising considering the incredible force of the storm. She paused to stare at the glowing screen, shaking her head. Curiously, DOE representative Rosabeth Carrera at the Teller Research Facility released an official report that the team of scientists on Anika Atoll was conducting a hydrological survey of ocean currents around the reef. From my personal knowledge of these events, however, it is clear that the statement is blatantly false. I recommend that little credence be given to such explanations. I suspect more accurate details are available in certain classified files. After another long sip of coffee, Scully reread what she had written. She surprised herself with her open skepticism over the official story. That wasn't what the Oversight Committee wanted to hear. But Scully knew about Bright Anvil and the test, no matter who wanted to cover it up. She could not report otherwise in her write-up. Scully sifted through her notes again and continued with her report. Assistant Director Skinner held open the door of his office. Come in, Agent Mulder, he said. Thank you, sir, Mulder said and entered the room. Framed portraits of the President and the Attorney General hung on the wall, staring down at him. This place held unpleasant memories for him. Mulder had been called on the carpet many times before for insisting on explanations the Bureau didn't want to hear. Skinner had often found himself in an uncomfortable middle position between a persistent Mulder and the shadowy string pullers who refused to be identified. You didn't get much of a tan in your travels, Agent Mulder. First to California, then out to the South Seas. I was on duty, sir, Mulder said. No time for sunbathing. Not during the typhoon, at least. Skinner looked down at the handwritten notes torn from Mulder's damp notebook. Mulder promised to type them up later when he got the chance. 
but the assistant director handed back the crumpled sheets of paper with a weary look on his face. Don't bother with a more formal report, Agent Mulder, he said. I can't submit this to my superiors. Then I'll write it up for my own use, Mulder answered, and I'll place it in an X-file. That's your choice, of course, Skinner said. You realize you have no corroborating evidence for any of these explanations. Neither the Navy nor the tele-research facility accepts your scenario. As usual, you have handed me a report filled with wild speculation that is proof of nothing except your ability to concoct supernatural explanations for events that have rational causes. Maybe there aren't always rational causes, Mulder said. Agent Scully usually manages to come up with them. Agent Scully has her own opinions, Mulder said, and while I respect her entirely as my partner and as an FBI field agent, I don't always agree 100% with her conclusions. Mulder pushed forward in the hard wooden chair. You must have contacted General Bradukas at the Pentagon, sir. He can corroborate many of the events that I've described in these notes. He knows about Bright Anvil. He knows about the ghosts. He sent me out there because he feared for his own life. Skinner fixed Mulder with a sharp gaze. General Bradukas has been reassigned, he said. He can no longer be reached for comment through the Pentagon, and his current whereabouts are classified. I believe he's participating in a new experimental test program. How convenient, Mulder said. And about this entire secret nuclear test, this bright anvil you keep mentioning, I don't want to see anything about it in your official report, not even in your X-file. Above-ground nuclear weapons tests have been banned by treaty since 1963. I know that, and you know that, Mulder agreed. But nobody seems to have told the Bright Anvil team. Skinner shrugged. You're the only one who doesn't accept the official explanation, Agent Mulder. Mulder reached over to retrieve his handwritten notes, knowing they would do no good if he left them there in Skinner's office. I guess that's always been my problem, he said, and then left to go find Scully, ready for their next case. Thank you.